Um, thank you very much, Paul, for welcoming everybody here today. My name is Suzanne Morissette, and uh, I am a new hire here at ACAD, Assistant Professor of Indigenous Studies. Um, and it's my great pleasure to be here to welcome you this morning. Welcome to our symposium. We're honored to be able to provide this platform by bringing together speakers from these territories as well as from other locations across Turtle Island. And uh, I see a lot of really, really good friends in, in the crowd today, and I'm really happy to be here. So just to give a little bit of background, uh, the idea for this symposium has developed in conversations with many people over the last few months. And I've also been thinking a lot about the kind of recent history of inclusion that um, Indigenous arts uh, has found in mainstream institutions. So there's been a lot of recent symposia and conversations um, at conferences, for instance, that have highlighted the past research and advocacy of Indigenous artists, curators, writers, who have really uh, been instrumental in, in creating space and, uh, and, and developing spaces of inclusion. This, these successes, I think, can be measured in part by some of the increased uh, recognition of Indigenous arts-based professionals that we're now seeing in mainstream institutions, such as uh, major public galleries in recent years. And so I think to the credit of these important precedents, we can start to think about how Indigenous peoples are now better able to talk about locating themselves in their work, uh, rather than the kind of framing of Indigenous peoples' practices um, that has been historically um, happening from outside of, of that community. Um, so these conversations, these, these are conversations that I've been having with my students here at ACAD, and we know we've been taking, uh, we have a course here, Contemporary Indigenous Practices, where these are conversations that have come up quite a bit, and uh, I know that my students are, are looking forward to hearing the presentations that we have in the next couple of days, and I hope they'll be asking lots of questions um, as we go along. And so we received the title for this symposium from uh, Casey Eagle Speaker, who, like Paul, we're very honored to have sit on the Elders Council here at ACAD. And in conversation with Casey about the kinds of conversations that I thought we might be having uh, between the kinds of presentations that, uh, that I've been talking to each of, of you about, we, we, we were presented with this title, Ag Shogomokshix, which is a Blackfoot concept that helps us to look at our relationships to local, national, international kinds of narratives of place, belonging, and history. And to think about this as a practice of making relations with all beings, so that includes both people and the land alike. So the presenters who have gathered together for this symposium are active agents who are locating their works, and we come together with this symposium as a platform for creating dialogue between people and place. And uh, I would just like to give uh, some thanks to our sponsors for this event who have helped to make everything possible. Uh, the Alberta College of Art and Design, of course, Calgary Arts Development, Calgary Foundation, Canada 150 Community Fund, Sidewalk Citizen, Suncor, and the University of Calgary. When I came into this role only uh, a few short weeks ago, I think it was about six weeks ago now, uh, I was met by the immense support of our team here at ACAD, and I wanted to offer my extreme and immense thanks to all those people who've come on board and helped to make this event possible. Uh, so in no particular order, uh, Lorenzo Fusi, Cassandra Paul, Tina Kinney-Brown, Justin Waddell, Ashley Scarlett, Ashley Slemming, and Alex Link for their important contributions to this event. And I also uh, wanted to highlight, we don't have it up on the slide right now, but uh, we were very lucky to have the opportunity to work with a second year design student, Asby Whitecalf, who, um, you'll see it come up in just a minute, designed our poster for this event. So thank you uh, specifically, Asby. All this to say, I'm really excited to be a part of this team and, and working here at ACAD, um, proving that we can, we can put on really amazing things together and to be a part of this team hosting you here today. So before I pass the mic over, I'm just gonna quickly highlight that the symposium is taking place in relation to a couple of exhibitions um, which are happening both here at ACAD as well as at the University of Calgary. Um, one at the Illingworth Kerr, present, uh, Future Memories, present tense, sorry. Um, and at Nickel Galleries, we have a retrospective of the work of Dr. Joan Cardinal Schubert, which 
um, is tied in with this event. Today we're going to be relocating at uh, 5 o'clock for a tour of that exhibition with Lindsay Sharman and, and she'll be coming up in just a moment to give you uh, a bit of an indication about that. Um, so I think without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Lorenzo Fusi. Thank you. Can I ask now? Thank you so much, Suzanne. Um, <clears throat> well, let me start. Well, my name is Lorenzo Fusi. I'm the curator at the IKJ Gallery here at the Alberta College of Art and Design. And uh, let me start by echoing Suzanne Morizette's acknowledgement of the traditional territories. The exhibition Future Memories, Present Tense, con uh, Contemporary pers uh, Practices in Perspective, represent the initial framework and premises for today's symposium in partnership with the University of Cal Calgary and the Nicol Galleries. Uh, so we just re remind of the exhibition, The Writing on the Wall Works by Dr. Johann Cardinal Schubert at the Nicol Galleries. We are very excited about this collaboration and thankful for the work put into the making of this retrospective exhibition that analyzes the legacy and importance of Cardinal Schubert over. Let me individually thank uh, Lindsay Sharman who's going to be following me in this presentation, uh, who has been curator of the show, and my colleagues Michelle Hardy and uh, Christine Soviak. I'm truly indebted to Suzanne, whose indefatigable work has made this symposium possible. Her knowledge and expertise are a great addition to ACAD's faculty and broader community. Thanks to her wide network of contacts and professional reputation, we have secured a remarkable list of speakers for this event. I would like to thank each one of them for their participation and support. In particular, I would like to salute Meryl, Mac Meryl McMaster and Peter Maureen, uh, who are the only two Future Memories artists who could not make it to the symposium uh, and for the opening of the exhibition. Uh, they are greatly missed today, but they were also otherwise committed. The other artists in, in the show are with us, and we shall have the opportunity to hear more about the work and practice over the next couple of days. I would also like to thank my team, Cassandra Paul, Anne Thrail, Jake Klein-Waller, Ashley Salaming, and uh, who is our curatorial intern, whose role has been generously, generously supported by the Rosa Foundation. Thank you also to all of the gallery attendants and our volunteers. Finally, I would like to thank Tina Kinney-Brown from, uh, from our Lodge Pool Center for her assistance throughout the entire organization of the event. As the curator of the Future Memories exhibition, I would like to add a few words around the genesis and development of the project. The exhibition had a long gestation and evolved uh, consistently since the initial premises. The focus became sharper as time went by, and time is actually a crucial factor for the project. Through the work of the six indigenous contemporary artists coming from different regions of Canada, we precisely wanted to explore the relation between storytelling and different categories of time. Ultimately, the intention was to challenge dominant historical narratives, starting by questioning Western ideas of time itself. The artists invo uh, involved in this project invite us to revisit conventional understanding of time, its li linearity, for instance, particularly in relationship to history making, as they introduce us to stories that are often autobiographical or personal, but also assume a collective dimension, clearly illustrating how the personal can become political. As they do so, they invite us to reflect on the actual power of time, or rather, uh, on the power that those who decide upon how time is devised and accounted for have. Uh, the reappropriation of time that these artists claim is a political act. It is a way to take full control and ownership of the stories that they have not been told, and to imagine those that they have yet to be written. Fast forwarding, rewinding, freezing time, Defining the measure of parameters against which time is measured is not only a political gesture, but is also a poetic and aesthetic act. One that requires the labor of true artists, such as the one that we gather together for future memories. I'm very grateful to them for their visionary work. So let me now introduce you to uh, bring to the floor Lindsay Sharman from the University of Calgary. Thank you. So thank you to Paul, um, thank you Lorenzo, and thank you Suzanne. Um, I'd like to echo Suzanne's acknowledgement of the land and indigenous people of Treaty 7 on behalf of the University of Calgary. Um, so I am not Christine Soyak, as it says on the list behind me. Um, 
Um, but my name is Lindsay Sharman. I am a curator for the U of C, and I'm the curator uh, specifically of the writing on the wall, uh, the work of Dr. Joan Cardinal Schubert. Uh, the writing on the wall uh, is both a publication and, publication and, an, and an exhibition. Uh, the publication has contributions from both uh, David Garneau and, and uh, Tanya Harnett, um, which both of which will be uh, speaking tomorrow at this symposium. Um, uh, and this evening, um, I'll be leading a tour of the exhibition um, at 5.30. Um, the exhibition includes over 30 years of work uh, from an absolutely amazing artist, curator, activist, writer, um, poet, um, the exhibition includes so many amazingly uh, powerful as well as beautiful works, um, which I don't want to tell you too much about because I want you to come um, on that tour um, this evening. Um, and I'd also uh, just like to call out uh, that we have uh, Mike Schubert, um, who is here, who's the, the artist's uh, husband, who uh, without his generous cooperation, the exhibition uh, would not have been uh, possible. So thank you um, for that. Um, I think it's incredibly important um, at this moment in time um, that two of the city's art galleries tied to academic institutions have uh, exhibitions of powerful, uh, influential Indigenous artists. Um, and as soon as uh, we both realized that um, we have these exhibitions coming up, uh, we started to work together on uh, extensive programming that could expand on those conversations. Uh, and uh, we've, we've come up with uh, extensive programming, uh, Wikipedia edit-a-thons, uh, different tours, uh, this symposium, of course, and I would also um, specifically like to draw your attention to a bus tour of Indigenous landmarks uh, that will be led by artists and elders, um, and that's going to be uh, Saturday, October 21st. I'm uh, particularly excited um, for that. Um, so once again, I would just like to extend a huge congratulations to uh, Suzanne for organizing this, and I'd like to just go back to when she was speaking and underline that she has been in this position <laughs> for six weeks and uh, has pulled together all of this. So I'm sure she will get, yes. <laughs> um, which, wow, you're very, very impressive. And thank you for all of this um, hard work and thank you for bringing us um, all together. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm very excited to hear um, from all the amazing um, speakers today and tomorrow, uh, and congratulations as well to Lorenzo and to all of the exhibiting artists um, for the opening of Future Memories present tense. Thank you. I would like to invite now Daniel Doz, our president, uh, to say a few words. So it's a, it's a great honor and pleasure to welcome you all uh, to the Alberta College of Art and Design. So our role here at the college is quite simple. Uh, it is to educate the next uh, generation uh, of creators, be craftsmen, be artists, be designers, be thinkers, be innovators. These are the individuals that will enrich our shared experience, our shared experience by questioning yesterday, confronting today, by imagining and dreaming tomorrow. Now, this is often not done in a vacuum, but rather it anchors itself in the past and in the present. This exploration occurs, and I'll use an architectural term I'm really quite fond of, occurs in the interstitial realm that exists between a reality and reality, however we define those. But I believe our deeper mission at ACAD, or dare I say, our shared responsibility is really to push the boundaries of our disciplines, as it is the, this way that we, as a community, as a society, truly move forward. Now, it, it's well understood that the future is not as much only in the progress mankind generates through sciences, but rather advancement in culture and the arts, it is because it is the cement that binds our communities and society at large. 
Thus, I believe this symposium is about enriching our experience. And to celebrate uh, today, or yesterday was the beginning of the uh, baseball playoff. I don't follow it, but I, I thought I would get uh, a quote to, to celebrate that moment. Uh, there, there was a baseball player in the, the 20s, uh, in the 60s, sorry, his name was Vernon Law, and actually he said it best when, I think it was in an interview, he expressed that experience is a hard teacher because she gives the test first, the lesson afterward. So I want to make it clear here that as academics, as artists, as innovators, our duty is to directly or indirectly be paradigm pioneers. As academia, such as ACAD, must be the place where we question the world, where we question ourselves, where we're not satisfied with the status quo, and where we constantly and continuously reinvent ourselves. Now, the timing of the symposium is most apropos, as tomorrow we will be, and you heard the term logical center, we'll be celebrating the first year anniversary of our indigenous resource uh, center, the logical center. Now, th this center was seen as a most critical first step in supporting not only our indigenous student population, which is about 11% of our student body, um, but also in supporting and raising awareness throughout our community. And this symposium plays a big role in doing that. So to that end, I very, very much look forward to the many conversations that will be generated through these encounters and wish you all the very best symposium. Thank you. I just want to see if this works. There's a little bit of, am I, okay, yeah. Here I am, okay. <laughs> Thank you for that introduction, and it's really nice to be here where, um, it's really nice to be here, Suzanne. I'm um, glad to be one of the pe many people surrounding you in this new place, uh, familiar people. I think that's really important. And thank you for inviting me, everyone. Um, I um, there's strawberries and blueberries, and the strawberries, uh, the strawberries. There are strawberries that grew around Lake Ontario on farms uh, north of the lake, between um, Oakville and Mississauga, in a place called Clarkson. There used to be all fields of gardens there, and people would move from um, people would move from reserves to for wage labor and work uh, picking fruit. And so my dad lived in Oakville. Uh, where these close to where these these fields were, and my mom was in a family who moved south to pick the fruit. Oh, let me just do this all over again. Um, I began with the basics, an action of picking and gathering, an act that I imagine my mother and her father and maybe her mother also did. Uh, maybe they each bent down to these small plants and berries. As people who moved south to work on farms and pick uh, odamen, uh, heartberry, or strawberry, looking back further, they were picking from the plants that grow on their own, not just in fields. After, I heard that after a fire hundreds and hundreds of years ago, the fire left a soil, a soil with a balance of acidity to grow these little plants. And these plants that grow are the blue ones. I think. Uh, they call them menin or blueberries. Uh, this is the point where I was thinking about food that comes from a place where some of my family is from. I'm thinking of the food and the colors and the marks. Um, I cook and from these berries I'm able to get the color I need. The color fades after a time, but after boiling and straining the consistency is smooth, uncomplicated consistent and desirable. Uh, straining, straining is a strain and, and leaves behind the seeds and skin. Absorbing happens without me noticing, without realizing I'm nearly seeped in it. 
The, sk the skin seemed to be where the color is. I'll take all the skins and make an ink, mix it with um, transparent screen printing ink, and then I can make these maps. Um, the skin color fades after a couple of years, so it looks like a tea stain. Uh, the blueberry skins need, need the inside of the berry to keep the colors rich and vibrant. That's something I learned. This is the blue, these are the stains that look like tea stains now. Okay, I, I think I gotta just start over again. Okay. Okay. Um, this work came from the kitchen and from my time in kitchens. These kitchens were domestic. Some were professional. Some were professional and not domestic. Some were around a fire. Seriously, like cutting meat with a group of women and cutting the meat small enough anyone could eat it with a spoon. Here are the many forms um, that I worked, these are the many forms that blueberries took. So I would boil them and puree them and strain them so that I'd get this nice smooth puree that you see in the container. And then I would get this um, kind of skin and seeds that are left in, the, in that strainer and I dry them, especially in this temperature, you can dry things really fast and easy. And then I'd grind it and I get this kind of purple powder. Um, I dried what was left and can grind it, grind it into a powder. I love the way that this strained uh, blueberry skin and seeds reminds me of bear poo. I wanted to see how things absorbed, so um, I set paper in, in this puree, in the blueberry, the strained, smooth um, liquid, the anthocyanin. Um, I put paper and then I was, you know, I put wood in, I let uh, the material um, kind of map their own story. Well, I couldn't stop them really to absorb. Um, so the, the spoons and the wood, I continued uh, dipping them and making these horizon lines. Um, I, okay, great. <laughs> I think of these absorption and stains as horizon lines. From the UBC archive, I found this amazing file, um, this map that profiles the rise and the horizon of the CP rail. Railway from Montreal, uh, from Quebec City to Vancouver. That's what you see at the top there. And these are my absorptions. Um, I'm just going to get some water. Um, during the summer of 2009, I walked with my cousin and her, uh, her son. Uh, my cousin Shelly and her son Gabriel um, from the site of Shinguak Residential School in Sault Ste. Marie. Uh, we walked east, um, staying as close to the train tracks as we could, but it was too scary to walk along the train tracks the whole way. So we took roadways and cut through fields, um, and we walked as far as Espanola, which is sort of where uh, the road goes down to Manitoulin Island. And this is all on the north shore of Lake Huron. We followed tracks for about 11 days, and the reason we did this was we were following a route that um, my, our grandfather had told us about uh, his route of running away from residential school at Shinguak and following the train tracks, and that was in 1919 or 1920. And um, he, the, the, the story, his account, um, talked about different sites along the way. And this, um, in his account of this journey, there was uh, this really high bridge um, called, over oh, that goes over the river, Mississauga River. And the Mississauga River flows into the north shore of Lake Huron. And the, riv and the, the, the bridge is a big metal bridge. It, uh, my cousin, called, my other cousin who I ran into on a back road on, during this walk told me it, he called it Trussell Bridge. And he said that's the same metal that would have been there, you know, so many years ago. Um, when I walked across it, I um, thought about the story 
because that was the first place my grandfather heard his language and saw people cooking by the river and they fed him and the friend he, he was with. When I walked across the bridge, I could see the water rushing below the, 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 ra the, the rails and there were like little gusts of wind. The water was about 50, 50 uh, feet below, I think. I'm not good at figuring out measurements, but it seemed far. Um, and the gust of winds would throw off my balance. And when I looked down to get my footing, I'd see the water flowing. And so it was really unsettling and hard to get across. But my cousin's son, uh, as he walked across, he balanced. He, didn't, he wasn't scared. And he balanced on the railway, um, the actual rail, no, ties, yeah. So I was obsessed with what I saw between the ties. And he just balanced on the rail. And so I felt like I needed to be there for him because he, he was being a bit of a daredevil. And he felt like he needed to be there for me to cross that bridge. So this is the first series of these maps that I made, um, screen printed. And this is, um, I call them blueprints. And they, they are maps of each, uh, different sites along that, um, along that story. Um, and so this is the first set that I made with just the skins of the blueberry grind, dried and ground mixed with uh, transparent screen ink. And I've made more since then that are the whole blueberry mixed together and they retain their color very brightly. Um, the, the series is called Blueprints. So I was thinking about um, in that title, this idea that the stories and the things we witness are um, kind of the, a blueprint of ourselves, a way that we can locate ourselves or um, the stories and things we witness are the things that how we kind of um, find a place and, a, a, and the stories that we sort of, yeah, locate ourselves is the best way to say that. Um, they don't determine who we are, but they are, they inform and they are part of us and part of me. Um, so I just started cooking up the blueberries and making these using the whole puree. And um, this was one place where I used a uh, carved rolling pin to mark the wall um, at, this was at Urban Shaman. And so it was a way of like kind of cooking something up and talking as artists talk. Um, this series, this blueberry marking and this kind of practice took me into this other project, which was called Shore Lunch. And Shore Lunch is a um, mobile food kind of camp kitchen, mobile camp kitchen, um, where I move from different, go to different shorelines and um, create uh, and feed people. Um, the idea is that uh, um, a couple things came out of this was one, first of all, I dedicated it to my mother because there was this stories of my mother. Apparently she was really good at fishing. I didn't know that part of her. She was, uh, she could just, um, she didn't need a fishing rod. Apparently she could just use a line and a stick and she could catch fish. She grew up near Georgian Bay. So I was thinking about her and I was thinking about having, cooking up fish on the shore and how lovely that is. Um, so I made this project, and so it was. This started on the lake shore of Lake Ontario, uh, in Toronto at Harbourfront, which is a revitalized industrial area that is now sort of more of a tourist destination. And um, there was different uh, segments to this performance, or I would say performance kind of gathering, um, that involved. Uh, one iteration was this one where I was making postcards for passersby, and then also sharing some. Uh, berry drink with them. And then we had a nighttime event where the, um, where I screened some of my animations. So I'll show you that for a second.
So that was screened in the nighttime on a big, uh, a really large uh, screen in the outdoors. And then we ended the, the Star Lunch performance in Toronto with um, uh, uh, Melody McIver and I uh, collaborated and we wrote some songs. Melody is a classically trained viola player and I'm a self-taught kind of punk rock guitar person from the 90s. <laughs> I've come from the, from the past um, here. And uh, we wrote some songs. So we wrote a song that was around uh, Wild Rice, uh, honoring Wild Rice. Um, Melodies from Treaty 3, where there is a long tradition of wild rice uh, cultivation and harvest. Um, and also I have a, one story from my grandfather about him harvesting wild rice as a child. Uh, we wrote song for the water, we wrote song for the, um, uh, I think it was for the berries, yes, for berries. Um, and then it, we just traveled to, uh, also Shore Lunch went to the shores of um, uh, the Rideau River uh, in Ottawa. Uh, and I added to it these picnic blankets that were um, made out of um, Canadian, Royal Canadian Mint money bags that were deleted or no longer being used. I'm sure they probably use some kind of plastic now to carry money around. And so these packed picnic, we all sat on the old, old money bags and had, um, had some wild rice, mixtures of blueberries and things like that. Um, and I shared stories about um, railroad bridges and rivers. Um, I went around to each and shared those. I continue sharing berries. It became a thing that I do, which I might be getting tired of, but at the same time, I, I guess that kind of offering is, I'm still trying to figure out uh, the importance of that kind of offering. So I was in residence at the Art Gallery of Ontario two years ago and I visited with many different people and groups. Um, and when I shared berries, I always used these little birch spoons and everyone, a lot of people donated them back and I created this collective animation. So then the collective animation that I created at um, AGO, uh, there were a lot of spoons and uh, it's stop motion animation so it's a lot of moving things a little bit at a time and taking frames, shooting frames. Um, and it was, um, it was displayed for Nuit Blanche in 2015, and it was on these big 16 by nine uh, screens. There were three of them in this one area, which, and the flow of the spoons as they crossed the um, screen uh, encouraged, directed um, the flow of people through the institution. And then they appeared on smaller screens in different parts of the gallery, which also, also tried to guide people uh, or move people along through the institution. So these are, if you could, this is somebody standing in front of the screen with the big spoons uh, moving by. And these were the spoons that people gave back after they ate berries with me. The last piece that I was gonna talk about here is another way that, another place uh, that I was able to share berries. During the reading of, 90, of the 94 Calls to Action from the TRC at OCAD University, um, which was organized by Ryan Rice. He invited me to do something with people um, in conjunction with this reading. It was four hours of reading them, and people could line up and read on the stage with a microphone uh, for as long as they wanted and then pass it on to the next person. I shared berries with people who read and who came to listen. Most people offered their spoons back to create this document. 
Oh, actually, no, actually, uh, Gerald McMaster is so tomorrow on. <laughs> sat there waiting. No, I'm just kidding. He, uh, yeah, so their, their people would come after they ate, and they would sew their, um, their spoons to the document. And so this, doc, this, this we talked about it being another way of documenting this moment of people reading the calls to action. Um, there was also a sort of uh, also a performance by Janet Rogers in the middle of it uh, with a more critical take on, on the calls and the processes of the TRC. Um, but in the end, we had this sort of document of the conversations of the people from the people who had participated or had come to listen. Uh, and this still sits in the, on the wall in the office there in, at the Indigenous Visual Culture Office at OCAD. Um, and that's all I have to say. Thank you. Oh, does anyone have any questions? <laughs> Comments, <laughs> thoughts that came to your head while I was talking? Things that relate to what I said. Yes. Because of the sound. Yeah, just the sound. The sound is like uh, footsteps in in wet leaves, but some I like layered the layered it, and with the layering, it sort of does have this sort of uh, train engine it's sort of sound. Well. Yeah, both of them have those. I've layered those. Um, the, that footstep sound, yeah. I, but I had a lot of fun creating the sound for those because I, just the sound track leads you to see things that I realize how much sound leads you to see see things in a different way. Um, yeah. So I like, uh, although I wasn't planning that, it, it I think it does do that. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, Suzanne. Hi. My friend. Thank you so much, Lisa, for your for your presentation. Um, I, I always love hearing you talk about this work, and um, it occurred to me as you were talking today that you've been working with blueberries for some time now, and, and in particular in relation to your grandfather's story, running away from residential school. Um, I, I think that exhibition at Urban was that in 2013 now? So yeah. Quite a few years ago, and I'm wondering, um, since you've been working with these this medium for so long, and, and you seem to have adapted it and brought it into different kinds of projects, um, you know, it, it occurs to me that you've adapted these blueberries as a kind of part of your visual language and whether the initial story from your grandfather carries through to these new projects that you've been working on or if it's kind of adapted or transformed in any way. I think it's really transformed. And I think like for purposes of my own um, need to, to um, explore material, you know, so it was the introduction to it was I went on that walk and I thought about the work I wanted to make after that walk and I felt like blueberries was part of that. But as I went to, as I started um, working with the material itself, I realized how much I was trying to illustrate something out of it, like this. Um, and the maps that I was making, I was working on them and I remember leaving my, leaving the space I was able to, you know, the, with um, the space that I had at that moment to work with, work in, I had a studio at that, in that moment. I remember going away for the weekend and coming back to that studio and looking at this work and thinking, um, what am I doing? Like, why am I doing this? Why am I, why am I trying to illustrate this so much? And that's where I thought, why don't I just give up? Because, and let, not give up, but like let, I think the difference between that scene and this scene are, was really important because I started thinking about the material itself and what it will do, um, which I found more interesting. And then at the same, in the same moment, I, I started doing these straining, I started straining um, through a strainer like I would to make that blueberry pigment, so this sort of kitchen strainer. But then I started straining it through. If the yellow is actually a screen, a screen for a silk screen or screen printing, I should say. And so I started straining it through the screen, the blank screen, and um, then it would absorb into paper. So in a way, it was, it was like kind of 
letting, give, giving up a little bit of the manipulation of that material and interested in what it wa was wanting to do. So I think it, there was a, uh, I think if I could just say definitely moving along with uh, not having to tell the story over and over again, like that it became about this material and what it could kind of bring to the practice. So. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. Any other questions or thoughts around things? I'll go to the, hi. Hi, uh, thank you, that was really great. Uh, but I was just wondering with the uh, blueprints, if they are archival in nature or more ephemeral in nature, like how they hold up in terms of that just exposure to every day. Yeah, um, they are, well, this, they are, um, Blueberry, or the anthocyanin has, uh, it reacts to acidity and alkaline, so you'll notice um, on this slide, the, this is very red, there's the acid, acids in the berry itself, and then as soon as it hits the gallery wall, which is this sort of more alkaline space, it changes in color. So uh, as well, in the same way, it, it is affected by light, and so there is a, a change that happens to these, and um, they'll maybe fade as well. So, although they are in a collection, they're, they're in a collection, part of a collection, I think they're gonna change while they're in that collection. And then uh, so, but I think as much of us as a, as a uh, maybe this sounds a little pretentious or something, but as much as a story is ephemeral or has the sort of, I think these, they are kind of ephemeral, but permanent at the same time. <laughs> to be troublesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but they're yeah, they're not they're not a registrar's dream, I guess maybe that would be. <laughs> um, the question that I have is like did you did it, did it cross your mind at some point is like I need to push away this domestic realm, this labor into more of I, I, I don't know how to express it into these more mm -hmm. No, uh, no I, I understand your question. <laughs> I understand it. Yeah. Um, no, I don't think so. I think it was more about um, because I also like trained as a chef, and so I've been in the professional kitchens and um, and contended with uh, male dominate those bit male dominated spaces. And so I think that what I ended up settling into was a job where I felt like I could bring that sort of uh, to bring how I really wanted to cook for people as opposed to a kind of high paced restaurant, you know, on the line, um, you know, contending with the adrenaline rush at the end of a shift, um, all those sorts of things. Like I ended up settling into a job uh, when I was cooking for a living uh, that where I really could cook for people I got to know, it was, it was different. So I think in, in, in rather than saying one or the other, it was like being able to assert the way I wanted to work within sort of what we might call as um, the food industry in that way. Um, and then in my practice, I guess, I haven't really thought about it, but I guess there is that, maybe, I didn't really think about that there was that present. But when you mentioned that, it made me think about the way that I contended with this idea of industrial, you know, or not industrial, sorry, um, those spaces, those more like food production spaces. Um, yeah, thank you. That's a really interesting thing to think about. Um, does that answer your question? All right. Yeah, yeah. But I don't think I'd one or the other. It's like it's like how do those things intermesh? It's like it's like serving people berries and then hitting the distortion pedal with a guitar it can all happen at the same time. Hmm? Uh, you didn't contradict, so I'm wondering, pushing away these domestic female. No, they're all they all are, are important to each other. I think like I'm I'm like on the cooking show with this down shooter for this. <laughs> you know, like I have my I've made my own. This piece, it's, it is a video, even though it's right now just the cover thing. Um, it's a video where I'm straining this blueberry through, 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 and it's a down shooter like you would have at a cooking show, like a down shooter of like, what's happening on the next stage, you know? So it's playing with those, those devices, I guess, too. Anyway, are we, do we still have time to talk? Okay. I, have, I just have a quick one. Uh, thanks, Lisa. Um, I'm just wondering if you, you noted that uh, you discovered that the skin of the blueberry didn't hold its color resilience without the, the meat of the blueberry, the interior body of the blueberry, yes? 
Well, when the blue, when the, uh, so I thought, oh, the, the color's in the skin, so because you know you see that, and so then I thought I'll isolate the skin and then put it in the transparent screen ink and go, yeah, and so I figured out that when I did that, so it wasn't just the skin, but it was mixed with transparent screen ink. It it turned into it faded fast. It uh, had okay, more. Okay, so it needed the the interior mm -hmm. of the blueberry to hold its yeah. sort of resilience, if yeah. you will. So did that trigger you or move you towards thinking about the relationship between I mean these ideas of sort of straining and ingestion that seem to happen after that in a significant way in the yeah. practice? Yeah, it made me really pay attention to also the idea of screen printing was another form of straining. Yeah. And I started thinking more about straining as a metaphor yeah. for not only, or another word for like a strain, but also straining in terms of a metaphor for what you leave behind, or what you keep and what you leave behind. And what's, what, you know, I, I think of it as a metaphor for like surviving socially in a way. Um, what do we leave behind? What do I share when I stand up in front of a bunch of people? And what do I not share? And what do I, how do I, what do I explain about an artwork and what do I, don't I explain? Or how are people going to take, uh, in, you know, who are they going to think I am just by looking at me and what do I tell them so they know who I am? All those things are kind of started coming in. Yeah, I couldn't stop thinking about them, laying awake at night. <laughs> and then I started, then I was thinking and straining and then absorbing is this other part of that, you know, that um, what do you leave behind and what do you absorb? And so th those are those are definitely things that I'm really thinking about right now. And and then that ingestion seems to be kind of in between, the straining and the absorption. Yeah. And or then it's that both. In, that's something you've started to share with others more yeah. readily. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of both, you know, because you yeah. you absorb and yeah. Thanks. Those are good questions. Okay. Is that? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um. Oh, yeah, there it is. So it's funny. I was just telling Lisa, like, how I find life goes in cycles. And I've been having a lot of these, like, going back to my past. Anyway, it's funny to be back here at ACAD because I dropped out of ACAD um, a while ago. And I'm excited to be back here, though, talking about this stuff. So anyway... So, uh, yeah, last year I was in the MST Performance Art Festival. I just wanted to point a few things out. That's Nellie McClung. She's massive. It's a massive sculpture in downtown Calgary, and I'm weaving a sash around her wrist. So you can see that's another one of her pals over there, one of the famous five uh, women, suffragettes, Canadian suffragettes. And... Um, <coughs> Yeah, it was it was an interesting thing to do. It actually, this wasn't my intention to do this, um, but it sort of came out of. I, w I had another piece that we'll screen after this. Um, so you see, the women are persons. This just in so great, and um, so <laughs> this was uh, something that I was sort of I sort of developed from another piece that I submitted to MST, which is this piece, actually, um, Wake Up, which is one of the things that's screened. Um, and I'm just going to let this play. You can watch it. Hopefully, you'll get the idea. Uh, yeah, so I was asked um, by MST to think about doing something more site-specific in the area where this film was screening, which was in the Arts Commons um, downtown. And so I'd just been learning how to weave sashes because, um, you know, I think a lot about being Métis and, uh, you know, we always have these sort of signifiers like what, what we're allowed to do. Not what we're allowed to do, but like, you know, what's the easy thing that you can point out that would be like, oh, that's Métis. So one of those things was sashes. And I've always loved, loved the sashes. Um, and I know the colors have really important meanings, historical meanings, and they're sort of like, um, there's family colors, there's stories that are associated with the, the traditional colors of sashes. Um, but I kind of wanted to start making these new sashes, contemporary sashes, because I've always wanted like, I call it like a disco sash. So I like, I really want it to be like silver and purple and teal, and you just can't find those. 
Uh, so that's why I started learning how to weave sashes. Um, so I'd been learning how to weave sashes, and I'd been thinking about, you know, what it is to weave a sash and, and all the, the stories behind it, and then doing it in these more contemporary colors and what that means. And uh, I don't know if you can know anything about sash weaving, but that sash I wove was not very, like, technically adept. Um, it was just like flat lines, you know, it's not like all those beautiful um, the arrowhead patterns and whatnot. And really that was all I could handle at the time and also doing it live in front of people who are coming up to me and talking like I knew I need to keep it really simple so that I wouldn't like mess it up too badly. It was also really challenging because uh, I was weaving it around Nellie McClung's arm, which was like just a really strange thing to do. But the cool thing about sash weaving, like a traditional sash weaving, is they're woven from the center out. So I kind of, I had been thinking about that, how you could do that, how you could use that um, as a performance. And so I realized if I wove one end, I could start with the other end and weave it around something and make it a part of that thing. It's non-destructive though, you know, like it's easy to cut off or whatever of the statue and I think that's what city workers did like 24 hours later. Um, <coughs> but I, I've always been kind of fascinated with, you know, with history and, and my place in the world and my place as a person, you know, who's Métis um, and uh, also in German and Ukrainian and trying to figure out being that mix, you know, like settler, indigenous, and trying to understand all those stories and where my place is within all of that. So <clears throat> when MST asked me if I would do something more site specific, um, I was weaving the sashes and I thought, yeah, you know, like I'd really love to um, weave a sash around Nellie McClung's wrist and kind of bind her. Um, because, uh, it, you know, it's always really bothered me. We have these very problematic figures in Canadian uh, society um, that, uh, you know, so Nellie McClung is one of the suffragettes and she got, uh, you know, women, she helped to have women recognized as persons in 1929, which we saw there on her little thing, but of course it's white women. It wasn't indigenous women, it wasn't women of color. Um, <coughs> And in fact, Nellie McClung was a fairly well-known um, proponent of racial hygiene. So that's like race purity, basically. Um, they were interested, like she was interested in eugenics. Um, you know, she was part of the people who uh, were interested in forced sterilizations of people, of women and men. Uh, for whatever reason, if they you know, were indigenous or if they had um, developmental disabilities, etc. So it's really complicated. And there's a lot of stuff all over Calgary and Alberta because she's Albertan, named Nellie McClung this, Nellie McClung that. There's statues of her. So it's not that I'm trying to say that she's bad. Um, I just wanted to draw some attention to this layered, problematic history. And uh, so I decided you know, to figure out if I could weave the sash around her arm. And when I was doing it, like, it was kind of almost this binding, right? Like, and it was also adding, adding myself as an indigenous woman, adding indigenous women to that Canadian narrative. And it looked really great on the statue too. They're like so dark and drab. And then like, it was just this like really flashy, brightly colored sash. Like I think it looked awesome. Um, and it also kind of like, you know, I, it was kind of cheeky really, because I thought it was really funny. I, I have official documents from the, um, I got them here at the Glenbow because they have some interesting uh, uh, half-breed uh, script records, um, so which is now how you sort of, one of the ways you can get officially recognized as Métis. If your ancestors had half-breed script, and mine do, um, then, you know, that's one of the avenues. So again, it's just that, that layer of complexity, right, to the, the, div 
to the de development of the Canadian nation state. So I have half-breed script records for my ancestors, and it just kind of like delighted me to no end to be like this half-breed, official half-breed woman <laughs> um, weaving this sash around Nellie McClung's arm. And uh, you know, she's like this racial purity proponent, and I thought that was pretty great. Um, it was an interesting process because we actually, one of the things I really appreciated about it was that we actually um, got uh, permission to do it. It wasn't like a, you know, a guerrilla thing or anything. We actually had to write a letter, Tom wrote a really wonderful letter um, to the Nellie McClung Foundation and to the artist, who's Barbara Patterson, who to add another layer of complexity, also then identified herself as Métis, which was really interesting. Um, I never actually met her, though. Um, so we had to write letters asking if we could do this. Um, I don't think we talked about eugenics or racial purity exactly, but we did say, you know, we want to look at this history of, of women and indigenous women being represented through these sculptures. And, uh, yeah, they, they said okay, and then we got a city permit and, and everything, so that was pretty amazing. Um, yeah, which was also good, because uh, it was interesting to be there. There were some people who actually did come up and felt very strongly about these statues and were really giving me a hard time about doing this. Um, so then, eventually, one guy especially, I. I showed him, you know, like, no, look, I have a city permit, you know, and then he backed off. And, uh, yeah, it was just my way of adding, trying to add, however briefly, you know, this part of the story um, to this larger story. And also, I think it's interesting because these statues, th these same statues are also in Ottawa, so there's that connection as well, which I really appreciated. Um, but as I said, I knew that it would get taken off. I knew it would not last long. Um, my only stipulation was that I didn't want to destroy it. Somebody else had to destroy it. So, and I think it was city workers. And uh, I don't know, there's something kind of, um, you know, it's that impermanence that does exist. Like if we don't keep telling these stories um, and remembering these things, um, they go away. And so all of my hard work, you know, I spent hours and hours weaving this sash um, it was it was cut away. It was destroyed, and um, yeah, that's okay. So, I didn't really start doing artwork like publicly until about three years ago when I moved back to Calgary, and uh, you know I moved back for a variety of reasons, but one of them was because I really wanted to start looking into the story of my great-great-uncle, Edward Beaupre, who was the tallest man in Canada. He was about eight foot three when he died, and uh, he was a Métis guy from southern Saskatchewan. And I just knew that I had to go home to, you know, back to western Canada. Um, I grew up in Calgary, and, and I knew I had to come back here to be closer to those places. Uh, to start to start those stories, start looking at those stories. So when I got back here, I didn't know anyone, and um, and I just started <laughs> creeping things on Facebook, like any art event that was happening, I would just show up, and I just kept showing up until people knew who I was. And um, eventually, you know, I, I got um, start to see what the possibilities were here. And I just moved from Toronto, right? So it's like way, way smaller and way less stuff going on for sure. Um, but definitely a lot better than I remember it what it was when I was growing up here. So uh, I was really starting to try and get into doing this documentary. I'd never done a film before. And everybody kept saying, that, oh, that's so cool, but you'll never be able to do a documentary and get any money if you haven't. Um, directed at least one film. So uh, I applied to this uh, mentorship program with uh, the Calgary Society of Independent Filmmakers and Imaginative. And um, I pitched 
this uh, project, which was like a performance art film, which you're now watching. And uh, it was just, I'd always wanted to do this actually as a performance, and I tried to do it in Toronto a few times, and it just never, nobody was interested. Um, so I pitched it as a film, and uh, it was to turn myself into Louis Riel in, in front of the camera. And uh, yeah, they were like, cool, you're in. So I got to do this film, and um, it, was, uh, it was a really interesting process for me. This is um, the uncut version. There's like a six, five minute long festival version with a voiceover, and it's just very minimal. And I'm talking about um, different ways that Métis people name ourselves. So Machif uh, or Tipem Zwak or Epidagosan. Um, those are both Cree words, those last two. Uh, those mean the people who own themselves and also half son, as in like uh, S-O-N. Yeah, child, a child. Um, and then Michif is like the Michif language, so like the Creole language that developed out of the fur trade. Um, I'm talking about the women who had made the beautiful floral patterns for um, their family's clothes. And, um, and then I have this one line in here where I say, how do you explain a culture in small talk? And I think that's what really uh, my time in Ontario um, really made me reflect on was, A, people would be like, you know, had no idea what, who Métis people were uh, or that we were like real. Um, and then B, when I, you know, one of the few things that I would always sort of fall back on if they said, what is that? And I, most people who've gone to school in Canada have at least heard of Louis Riel. So I would always say, okay, well, if you've heard of Louis Riel, well, he's Métis, so I'm kind of like him. And that was, you know, kind of end of conversation. But, you know, how do you explain that, like, at a party or something for, and whenever it comes up for whatever reason? So I just, I, that always stuck with me, and I thought it would be kind of funny um, to, like, explore that by actually turning myself into Louis Riel. You know, because I don't know what they thought I was talking about. Like, did they think I was, like, this 19th century man? Or, like, was, like, some kind of politician? Or, I don't know, some guy with a great mustache? Like, I don't really know what they, th they thought I meant by it. So I decided to do just that and turn, turn myself into Riel and see what happened. Um, and then the weird thing is I look a little bit like him. Like, that was totally unexpected. Like, I was like, you know. Um, so anyway, that's this film that I did. And uh, after that, um, oh, and then I guess the last thing I'll say about this is I was thinking about speaking, but I felt like that was too much of a, you know, Riel basically martyred himself for the cause. Um, he was executed by the Canadian government for treason, the only person in Canada ever executed for treason. So I felt like it was a really big responsibility to like start talking when I'm all dressed up as Louis Riel. Um, but I had been hearing this quote, and I still hear it, and there's this film that came out recently, and it pisses me off. Um, God, what is it called? When They Awake or something? It's a it's a documentary about indigenous musicians in Canada, mostly. And they use the quote. And anybody who's in the arts probably knows what the quote is. So it's, my people will sleep for 100 years, and when they awake, it will be the artists who give them back their spirit. It's a really beautiful quote. It's really inspiring. Um, but it's a bit frustrating sometimes, because I think people often say it, and then they're kind of like, they just sit back. And I don't think that was the intention behind it. I think it's, no, keep going. We have a lot of work to do. Keep making the work. Keep, you know, keep getting out there. And especially with Métis people, people know so little about us. So it's really important to make those stories and, and discuss who we are and et cetera. Um, <coughs> And that documentary pisses me off because they use the quote, I think it's the very first thing that is in there, and then they have zero Métis musicians in it. Like, I just, I, you know, it's fine, it's an inspiring quote, but at least respect where it came from. So, <coughs> anyway, the thing I finally decided to do was, um, in the very end, 
I look into the camera, you'll see it here, and it's subtitled in French because this was shown in Montreal. Uh, I say, wake up. Because I wanted to acknowledge that, that quote and that connection with art and visual culture. Um, but I didn't want to just say it again. I, I felt like that was maybe the one thing I could say that I think, you know, if Riel were alive today, he'd, he might say, OK, let's keep going. So that um, was a, a choice I made. And um, so from this, I, I went on to make another film. And it's called Sweet Night. And um, some of you have probably seen it. And it's about um, this young Métis woman who's sort of learning about who she is. Um, her friend takes her out to a field. Her friend's not indigenous and teaches her about sweetgrass. She doesn't know about sweetgrass. Um, and then, you know, it's, they're both women. They make out. Um, and then later on, when she's on the train with sweetgrass, she meets this Blackfoot guy who starts hitting on her. And so that's. That was uh, a film I did last summer, 2016. And um, you know, I want to look at the, the ways that it's challenging, right? Because we're not just w these one-dimensional beings. Um, we have all these different layers of, of who we are um, that, that happens. And so this young woman um, trying to be like a good Métis, would it, and she doesn't quite know what that is, obviously. Um, and then also dealing with, you know, like sexuality and just just being a person in the world. Um, and the, it also looks to though to you know my own experience growing up in Calgary. And uh, I know you know this is I know this is traditional Blackfoot, uh, Stony Nakoda, it's Tina territory, and. Um, that definitely, you know, I remember, I remember that and trying to figure out how I fit into that because there was always this sort of vague, like, I knew we were native, but I wasn't quite sure how, except every now and then <laughs> um, my dad would say these sort of random things like, we're in enemy territory. <laughs> I would be like, what? You know, who are our enemies? Um, so, you know, trying to piece that together, like, as a young person and then being here and trying to understand how I related to, to the people who are here as well. Um, yeah, so that was, uh, that was a fun thing to do. And um, it's something I think about a lot now, especially now that I've moved back to Calgary, you know, how to relate to um, and work with and find common ground with uh, the people whose territory this is that my family moved to when I was very young. But also being very much from here, you know, growing up here and um, and feeling very connected to this place as well. So, uh, yeah, and then I guess one other thing I'll mention, um, which is kind of interesting, is uh, um, part of this larger ongoing project to look at, at Métis artists and look at us together and see, you know, what, what everybody's doing. Um, me and my uh, co-curator, Amy Malba, for now curating an exhibition of contemporary Métis art um, for the Art Gallery of Alberta, which will open next May. And uh, that's been a really interesting process. And um, we definitely, we don't want this to be, it's not like the only, obviously, we hope it won't be the only show, but we want it to be a beginning uh, so that we can look at all these intricacies, because just like, you know, when people talk about First Nations, Inuit, Métis, within that, there's so many groups, right? And, and that's true for Métis as well. Um, there's people who are, like, more Scottish, like, uh, and, you know, there's so many different mixtures. There's so many different communities. Um, even, there's not a lot of Michif speakers at all. There's something like 80, I think, now in Canada. But um, even within those communities where there are Michif speakers, the Michif is different. Um, and then some people have really strong connections to their First Nations um, communities, as well as being Métis. Um, people have strong connections to their European roots as well. Like, so it's, it's really complicated, and um, it's something that we're trying to look at, not find any easy answers to, but just to explore um, a little bit more. And I mean, I guess one story about that is my uh, forever, you know, because I hear this word machif. And so I was asking my great aunt, because um, she's the oldest 
living person who's most directly related to Edward Beaupre. She's 87, that was her uncle. And uh, she never met him because he died very young. But forever I kept asking her if she spoke Michif, and she kept saying, I don't know what that is, I don't know what that is. And then finally in January I got um, my dad to come out with me, they get along really well. And I actually got him to interview her, and I reshot an interview about Edward Beaupre with her. And I said, Dad, you ask her about Mitchiff. And so he was asking, like, okay, so, you know, Jesse wants to know if you speak Mitchiff. And she, I don't know why, but after literally years of me asking her this, it clicked. And she said, oh, you mean Mitchiff? Yes, I speak Mitchiff. We all speak Mitchiff. And that's, it's um, a linguistic difference, right? It's a different dialect. So I just, it hadn't even crossed my mind. I've heard the word metif before, but I didn't, it hadn't even crossed my mind because usually sort of in the mainstream, everybody falls back and says mitif. So I hadn't thought to say, or metif, you know? And so that really just drove home to me that these, these connections that exist, but also the differences between different communities based on you know, where they were um, in Canada. Yeah, so, um, and I guess the last thing I'll say is I actually just spent uh, a really fun two weeks out in Duck Lake, Saskatchewan. So I do have, uh, you know, my ancestors came from sort of up around there, which Batosh is up there. And um, that's where, you know, the, there was the last stand between the Canadian government and the Métis people. And so we did a play, it was an all Métis cast, it was super fun. Uh, we spoke French and Michif, um, which is really challenging. And it was for school kids. And uh, we, we, it was like a roving play on the land. And the idea was sort of to tell people some of this history from, from our point of view, rather than from like Parks Canada. Um, and also just to like let these kids know, because probably a lot of them are Métis, um, and some of them know and some of them might not, and just, you know, let them know that this is, you know, we're still here and we can talk, and so anyway, that was super fun, and um, I got to be Louis Riel in that play too, actually, and address the kids. So I actually did speak as Riel um, for that, and uh, that was really fun, like actually, we found some of his writing, and I actually quoted it to the kids and stuff. And I think the best part about that was at the end of the play, uh, this little boy came up to one of the other actors, Marjorie Bocage, and said to her, like super proud, he just said, we're still here. <laughs> and she looked at him and was like, yes. And did you hear Riel? He said, we'll be here forever. And he just said, yeah, <laughs> and walked away. So that was really a um, super fun thing to do. Yeah, so I mean, I'm kind of all over the place. I do a lot of things and um, ask me questions. Would you mind just Hi, um, I'm Mike Schubert. Um, I. Uh, I think if you explore the famous five, you should have uh, continued a little further because the horror of what they created with the eugenics movement, like they were the leaders of the eugenics movement, 400 Native women were jailed because of her, them and uh, because they were supposedly feeble-minded and uh, they were sterilized and um, I, when, it, when the analysis eventually was done that some of these ladies couldn't speak English and that's the reason why they were considered feeble-minded, they were speaking their own language only and uh, some of them were sp spoke French instead of English because they were Métis and uh, I think uh, we celebrate the famous five so much but we should also realize the horror that they created in the society. Thanks for that. Thank you very much for such a good presentation. 
I'm intrigued by two things that are not related, but uh, the first one is that I would love to see what kind of permit the city have, because there's something interesting that you, that you said that you had a permit for it, which I find in and of itself uh, is contributing to the work in a quite interesting way. Yeah. To see. So, um, you know, what kind of categories of permit <laughs> would, would in, uh, allows uh, Jesse Short to weave a sash on? <laughs> I don't Does remember what it was. I, th I think it's like an events permit or something. Because I think we should, those permits should be. Oh, yes. was it? <laughs> it was a letter from oh. Quinn. It was. Thanks, oh, Quinn. I was hoping that we had a whole new interesting kind of permit. But at least, thank you very much. We will know how to, uh, how to ask for the next one. <laughs> That's a letter from you. And the other one, which when you told me, when you were saying that um, Edouard Beaupré was uh, related as your great uncle, I think you said? Great, great. To see, yeah. Coming from Quebec, he was a legend in Quebec, I which know. is a very strange appropriation. That's because they kept his body in a glass case at the University of Montreal for like oh. 60 years. Yes, yes, <laughs> I know. And refused to give it back to my family. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. To see. And obviously, it's, it's the same, it's the one and only. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, uh, this, uh, and th therefore it is the one at the University of Montreal was my own. I wanted to make yes, sure. Yes, that's him. But which he's buried in Willow Bunch now, which where is he was a, from. Yes, but that was but it took us 20 years yeah, of fighting with the story. university to get his body back. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Jesse, <coughs> do you know the name of this building? Of this building? This building. This is the Nellie McClung building. Oh. You have just done your presentation in the Nellie McClung building. Sweet. You're welcome, Nellie. Hey, Jesse, uh, thank you for your presentation. It was, it was wonderful. Uh, just, uh, this is a hot topic right now, of course, and that's monuments uh, that are uh, uh, created for certain individuals who are, you know, of course, have suspect histories. Do you have any opinions or thoughts about the tearing down of these uh, monuments? And, uh, uh, and uh, what, are you, what are your thoughts uh, on that? Yeah, I mean, I think I need to think about it more um, because I do think it's complicated, although I am well aware of what Nellie McClung and, and those women did, and even Tommy Douglas, who's you know, responsible for our health care system, was also um, huge into eugenics and racial hygiene and all that shit. So... Um, I think it would take more than tearing down statues, but that might be a good start. Like even the, the Langevin Bridge, which they're renaming, right? It's, they, I definitely think they should rename it, but I also think there needs to be acknowledgement of what was there, why it's being renamed. You know, like it's not, I think that's simple. And that's the part, I guess that's sort of part of this reconciliation project, although I'm not a great fan of all the rhetoric around that. Because um, really, I think for these things to be done in good, honest ways, all of these histories have to be addressed, even when it's difficult. They have to be taught. They have to be taught, they have to be discussed. You know, people will get upset, and they just have to be upset. And we can't, um, we can't give in to people's guilt or shame or what have you. Like, we just, we have to move through it. That's the only way to, to get through it, is to actually just go through it, even though it's uncomfortable and difficult. And that, when that starts happening, I think, and it's not just politicians giving lip service, people starting, you know, indigenizing and being like, well, we have like one person working here, yay, like, um, 
we have to, but we have to do that, right? That's part, we have to be very, very honest and just go through those difficult feelings. And that's, that's how you honor those stories. You feel the feelings, be there, be real. Don't shy away from it, you know? That's what I think. Thank you, Jesse. Um, I I'm curious about the documentary, and especially after the questions earlier too, just about thinking. I, I mean, is it happening? <laughs> first off, uh, that's my first part of my question. Yeah, it is happening slowly. Like I did. Um, I think it's challenging because it's so close to me. Yeah. And people have like told the story a lot, but never anybody in my family. It's always been people coming to us from Quebec or from Ontario or okay. wherever, right? And they come in and they interview family members and then they just disappear and we never hear from them again. And then we're like, oh, look, a documentary. So uh, that's why, you know, I wanted to become, do film so that I could be a director, so that I could get creative control. Yeah. Um, and I'm not, I'm sure that whatever I make, I won't please everybody, but I will do it with the most respect and care that I, I yeah. can because it's my ancestor, you know, and, and I want to be able to provide a platform for us to talk about him in a way that he's a human, he's not an object in a glass case or, you know, on display in a freak show. Yeah. Um, so it's slow. I, I'm looking for a producer right now. If anybody knows an awesome producer, please let me know, um, to help me navigate sort of like the legal stuff and all of those things I don't really quite get about making the film industry. Um, yeah, it is happening slowly. Okay. Um, I'm taking my time. Yeah, I think that's a really, um, I like, uh, appreciate the sort of position that you'll take with that story being close to the subject matter and like that'll be uh, I think a real strength to the piece and also just thinking about um, addressing or confronting or somehow him being kind of a part of a collection or being a oh maybe my time's up oh no <laughs> and and so anyway I think that I like I think that there's some there's something really um, and I'm excited about it so I don't know that doesn't help getting producer but uh, <laughs> there's something really interesting about this story that is um, yeah uh, it's like yeah about his body being displayed as well as being this relation you know like those the tension between those those different kinds of ways his body is anyway I hope that it comes to be. Thanks. Thanks, me too. Thank you so much. Tongsi Anita Tenetek. Let me just pull up my presentation here. Um, my grandma says I can speak a little quickly, which is funny because she says I speak Cree too, actually, too slowly. So if I do speak too quickly, just let me know, like put up a hand or whatever. Um, so my presentation is called Thinking Beyond Criticism, Indigenous Arts Writing Beyond the Limits of Time, Space, and Production. <coughs> um, I just want to thank everyone for having me here today. Um, I always get like real imposter syndrome in these spaces, so I really appreciate you guys um, bringing me here. <coughs> so this idea of writing beyond time, space, and production it's something that I've been thinking about in my kinship with urban queer folks, um, in particular BIPOC folks. And when I'm talking about time, I'm talking about this idea of the nonlinear body. So we work within these fields that um, consider linear historiography as a dominant mode of historicizing arts, but that's complicated for indigenous peoples because many of us have correlate relationships with our ancestors forevermore or um, our descendants. And so we exist in different sort of temporal time spaces. Um, and also space too is like so interesting because I had a conversation with Jolene Ricard recently where she talked to me about 
um, how she struggles to write political theory because so much of her political work comes to her in dreams, but that's not a realm where we're allowed to talk about very much within Western thought, but as uh, certain indigenous peoples, like we cross over into these different planes and that really affects our daily lives and how we interact with our relations. Um, in production, I guess this is just, <laughs> this kind of plays into maybe an alternative title this presentation can have, um, being that I never wanted to be an arts critic, I just kind of became an arts critic through my relationships with artists, and um, maybe I'm just like too soft for this industry that's really scarcity based and um, about production. <laughs> Um, so I never, I just came into art criticism really like um, backwardsly. I have a creative practice, uh, right, mostly creative nonfiction and poetry. Um, this is my book, uh, Bawa Jige Win. Sorry, my Anish is not as good as my Cree. Um, and I started writing this book. It came from a writing practice I started after my mother passed away. And I was having very prolific and intense dreams. And an elder told me that I should be writing my dreams down and that those are actually visions that are going to help me heal through this process of grief. <clears throat> and so this book was accumulation of one year of doing a writing practice for every day I would wake up and the first thing in the morning I would do would be to write about my dreams. And as it expanded, it expanded more um, than just about my dreams into like visions as a whole. So visions in sweat lodge or even visions when I was doing hallucinogenic drugs. Like these are things that made their way into my poetry collection. And on the right is Mamawi Atsimuak, and it's a indigenous lit art and criticism, criticism journal that I self-publish and edit. Um, it started in Montreal, and it's like a, it, call, it came out of this space. The first art review I wrote was about Dana's work, actually. And um, Dana and I are we, friends in Dijage, and her work spoke to me in ways that indigenous art hadn't previously, and it was such an emotive experience just being in the gallery and seeing that um, those sort of works depicted for the first time in spaces where I hadn't seen my identity previously. Um, and so my first arts criticism that I ever wrote was about Dana's work for Mamawati Atsimuak because I really felt that no one was doing the freaks right. Like, <laughs> like no one got this kind of work. And when they did try to talk about it, it you could see some curators were really struggling to make that leap. Like they just, it was really hard for them to integrate BDSM aspects into like indigenous art. Cause it really, like it's pretty revolutionary. Like I think I can say that about Dana's work. Like no one's really done this kind of thing before. Um, so my criticism practice actually grew out of having close relationships with indigenous artists who then I saw that there was a lack of a hearty criticism of, about their work and criticism that their work deserved. And I saw a dire need for good arts writing. <coughs> Um, oh, I also co-founded Critical Sass Press, and so I've been tabling queer book fairs for like the last 10 years with my best friend who's Black Métis. Um, we had this press where we just wanted to publish radical feminist queer literature, and that's the community that I came out of and came up in. Um, and also I had a sort of administrative practice that grew out of the barriers that indigenous artists face when they were writing their grants. And I think, um, so I've gone through university and now at my master's I feel like I'm really good at writing like applications and stuff. So I often will gift those skills back to indigenous artists that I work closely with um, to try to get funding for their creative practice. And this is kind of where the Indigenous Arts Council emerged from. There was a group of folks who I was in conversation with, um, queers, indigenous women in the Montreal, Toronto area, and we were talking about this uh, new funding that was gonna go into the arts programs for indigenous arts. And we were like, well, who's gonna get this money? Like, and basically, it was kind of just this trick that we did. We, we like wanted to like learn how to write applications um, that would fit their uh, grant language so that we could take the money and like um, sort of jam it a little bit and like put it back into community. And we really grounded our curations and our festivals in this idea that we wanted to see more community-based curation happening. And what we saw in our communities, um, in particular, because I organized Atotem with my close friend Mo Clark, and what we saw was we were continually going to these literary festivals and they were all men. <laughs> and like, we would be like the one token woman or like the one token gay on like the entire panel. But we just wanted to come together and show curations about love and like the community building that we saw happening in our relationships that wasn't getting as much like airtime or space as these uh, masculinist perspectives. 
So that's what I mean when I talk about community-based curation. We didn't really, um, it's not like we sat down and we were like, okay, who's hot right now and who do we want to curate? We were like, who do we mess with? Who do we wreck with? And who do we love and who loves us back? And who do we want to share space with in this festival? <clears throat> and so for, in that way, I think that me and the folks that I've worked with, um, we've really prioritized working from our relationships and curating from the heart and um, try to distance ourselves from this ego that kind of tends to emerge within the arts. <clears throat> Um, Winnie Skatan was actually my first indigenous feminist art conference. I did it in 2013, <laughs> 2012. Um, and the cover art is by Anne Marie Consmo, who is another artist who I'm close with and collaborate with a lot. And Winnie Skatan means let's rise up. And it came from this idea, uh, Nidasana Tik, which is my honored siblings. And it came from this idea that festivals and shows and um, curations, they aren't they aren't that, like the way that we describe them through arts administrative language, they're gatherings of like kin, new and old, um, we're making new relations when we come together, uh, we're, we're building spaces of care with one another, so we wanted to create programming that really reflected that. <coughs> so Atotem was a day of panels, it included Leanne Simpson's album launch, um, and a bunch of folks came out, it was just like a good time, Erica Lee, uh, Tracy Lindbergh, um, and we just had conversations about the issues that were affecting us and they were so unhindered because it felt like for the first time we were able to cultivate conversations that we wanted to have with each other. <coughs> and so that's I guess when I started moving more into formal arts writing because artists started asking me to write for them more formally um, and I created a relationship with um, someone who's my mentor now, Heather Iglo Liarte, and I went into uh, a master's of art history with her. And the first thing I published in a, this is so weird, like a, like a, a publication that's like respected or whatever, was Visual Cultures of Indigenous Futurism in Guts. And it went pretty viral, which like surprised me. Um, I think that was likely about the perspectives it brought and the artists who weren't in the canon before or maybe were considered like a low, lower caste of artists because they were community-based artists. Um, and I attempted to sort of talk about Futurism and problematize this like theory around futurism, but also talk about de de decolonization and how it's becoming increasingly um, flippantly used within institutions with like with little or no meaning. But there was also a simulta simultaneously simultaneous movement happening in political theory where there was kind of this masculinist culture where um, men were coming for elders and women who were talking about reconciliation in their work in very like uh, aggressive ways. And so I talked about this language of reconciliation um, and the infantilization of elders and the responsibility to seek nuance when we're speaking with our elders about these things because when I hear the way that they talk about reconciliation, it just reminds me of my own kinship teachings. So I can see how these things can like flow in and out of one another. Um, so when I was talking about um, futurism, I think this is what really people really picked up what I was putting down because I was talking about queer artists who were trying to envision new pathways to resistance, and this included using BDSM as a space to consensually and sex positively deal with trauma, uh, intergenerational trauma, and it was um, like exciting, I guess, because these sort of uh, perspectives hadn't been written about in this way before. <clears throat> Um, so the next article that I wrote uh, in Art Criticism was Making Space and Indigenous Art for Bull Dykes and Gender Widows. And this one, it just got away at me. And I like, I look back at this moment in writing this and I'm like, I wish that I had just taken out, I had never written in the line that made it so prolific and so political because there's so much, um, I feel like kind of made it making writing in here, talking about the artists of my generation who are part of this new resurgence um, well, we're, it's, it's not new, like we're drawing, we, we're drawing from history of people who've done this work for us before and we're coming to these spaces we're able to articulate and uh, be so bold with these representations because of the space that they made for us, but um, yeah. <clears throat> um, one of the biggest criticisms I actually got about this article was that I was being queer normative because I am Cree Métis Soto. And so folks were like, why do you need to frame this in terms of queerness? And why can't you just frame it in terms of um, returning to your own traditional gender? And that's like such a complex question that I do want to break down <clears throat> because 
I think that for a lot of urban indigenous folks, uh, our cutie BIPOC kin are sometimes more of our kin than these communities of indigenous peoples who um, can, we can have conflicting ideals with. Um, and I wrote this poem about it actually where I was like, you can tell me how queer norm normative I am, or why don't you tell the elders who refused to hug me in ceremony when I went back to my territory? So it's complex. Like we have to claim kinship kin where we can find it, and people who see us like truly as who we are. And so I'm not ashamed to say that I have deep kinship with people who are non-indigenous and in urban spaces. And I think that urban experience is really interesting too, because there is something really indigenous about and prairie indigenous about love for the city and like that hustle and like pounding the pavement and like I just feel like East East Saskatoon and like North Central Regina like that defines my indigenous identity um, and it's complex to say that people who live in the city aren't treaty people because I just feel like the Indian Act cut through my women kin and it forced them off of our reservations. Um, they're, so I come from a uh, patrilineal, I'm registered to a patrilineal uh, Ojibwe community, and that patrilineality, it sort of transformed into misogyny in my nation. It sucks, it, it's, but it's true, and it happened. Um, and a lot of my women can were forced off our reservation because of uh, pervasive violence, and that's something that really bothers me when people talk about urban people as not being treated people, because the treaty literally cut through us. Like, you can't say that we're not treated people because the treaty is embedded within our bodies and it forced us into these urban spaces to find new ways to like love and share space together. <clears throat> um, so with that, I guess I'll admit that probably my feminist discourse does come from community affect, from my own community where I, I, res like I come from, but I also just think that I'm really rigorous and I don't take shit like my grandma taught me, so. <laughs> So, and then this sort of culminated, all this work, it just culminated in this issue that I just published for Canadian Art for uh, the summer, um, this Danny Danger on the cover, and this is another one of our relations from Montreal, Adrian Huard, who's also, so, so funny, we're all, I just realized that right now, we're all from Manitoba, like nations in Manitoba, we created this cover together. Um, and it was like a really beautiful process, and I am so proud of like what we created together. I'm gonna cry if I talk about it. <laughs> um, so this, this issue was actually meant to sort of like honor the people in my own community who I work with, who I see leading with love and all their actions and all their work, um, which I found to be predominantly women and two-spirit folks. Erin um, Sutherland uh, curated the first spotlight that was predominantly indigenous women and two-spirit people. And we had a similar conversation about how she felt scared to just publish a, in our community, to publish a curation of solely women artists and the backlash that we might get from men. But then we sort of broke it down together when we were like, but these are the people doing the kind of work that we want to talk about, and these are the kind of people who we share kinship with and who we want to support. <clears throat> so it, it was a really interesting thing to navigate. And also seeing the response was, was really interesting too. Um, I don't know, it's got people a little shook, but it's, it's cool, I'm like happy that the conversations are starting. <clears throat> and we did some pretty cool sh like stuff with it too. We talked about, uh, Black Indigenous Solidarity. I had an interview with Charmaine Nelson where we talked about um, her work pulling from archives to trace histories of Black Indigenous resistance and slavery, which was amazing. Um, we did street fashion, which like has always, um, when I went into my role as editor, there was like a little pushback about because we were like, okay, well, what is fine art or whatever? And I was like, you can't talk about Indigenous art without talking about clothing art. So. Um, really urbanizing it, making it modern, and making it about what our lives were like right now in the cities where we lived. We did a retrospective of Nation to Nation. Um, I was really honored to have uh, Ryan Rice and Scott Winotti uh, sit with me and share a lot of stories with me about their experience um, in the indigenous art community. And it felt so important for me to like uh, make a capsule of that moment in history and, and what they created because when you're learning indigenous art in the university, you never hear about nation to nation. You only hear like the five big guys or whatever. And so uh, a part of my work also is not just about talking about this moment and like what the, the feminist and queer art that we're creating right now, but also recontextualizing that art that happened then and bringing it into this realm as like a, uh, just as respected, even though it was maybe seen as like lower than because it was like more community based or whatever. Um, we also had an interview with Leanne Simpson and Jared Martineau that really blew my mind. It talked about just how 
fine arts never knows how to categorize indigenous art, and the need to categorize indigenous art is actually colonial affect because they want to uh, uh, project ownership over our bodies and our visualities. Um, and so talking about how can we really disrupt this model of like how art is curated and like fit into these puzzle pieces of the arts community right now. Uh, yeah, I think that's all I really wanted to say. Open up to questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for speaking. It's um, when this issue came out, just like I remember it. It came into uh, my workspace, and I looked at it. And said, "What is that?" And my coworker said, "It's a new issue of Canadian Art." It's like, "Oh my God!" Like, yes, <laughs> that's fantastic. Uh, so this is a very broad question, but uh, how has how have how have you find your time working with this like major Canadian? <laughs> institution because uh, I think you're bringing these really interesting and important ideas into what is what might be uh, a very established framework yeah um, like no jokes it's hard for sure like there's a lot of work that needs to be happening within these institutions and the emotional labor always falls on the shoulders of the indigenous folks who work in those institutions so I mean, yeah, it can be a little exhausting, I'm not going to lie, but it's work that I want to do and that I see as my responsibility to do, to carve out spaces for the people who come after me, and um, I think a lot about refusal and Leanne Simpson and how she's like, if you're doing anything in these institutions, you got to fuck with them, like, you got to you gotta rearrange some shit if you're in there. And, like, even, <laughs> and, like, um, I thought, I think a lot about this, co this cover, too, because it's not just, like, this was a struggle, like to get this on the cover of Canadian art, like Dana and I worked and it was like a lot of emotional labor for both of us and like we would call each other on the phone like crying about like the shithead at Chapters who blocked her cover because like it was too sexy. They tried to modify Adrienne's body by like removing her nipples, like so this, <laughs> it's not even, this isn't even the original cover, this is an edited cover and I think that's an important story to tell too because this maybe isn't even the exact culmination of mine and Dana's vision and for what we wanted for this cover. It was still censored a little bit, so it's hard. <laughs> yeah. Steps. Yeah. All right, while you're revealing things, um, I'll just ask then. Um, did you feel working with an institution like Canadian Art that you had the kind of uh, infrastructure and support to, to make some meaningful change? I mean, I'm pretty aware of uh, the essay um, and the um, er erratum around Archer Pachalis. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. I mean, to me, that's not, I don't put that on you, I, I put that on the institution. No, it's not okay. It's for, for not adequately supporting you. So, could you maybe <sighs> give some sense? I mean, we're in an institution. <laughs> I like go into it. So, maybe yeah. just give some, instead of going into it, just give some sense of a bit of a framework because mm -hmm. uh, this is something we all have to deal with as Indigenous mm -hmm. people when we go into institutions. So, mm -hmm. best, uh, what, what's the, um, what did you learn from that, and what do you suggest for these ears here to hear about that? I know it might be a little obscure. People might know what I'm talking mm -hmm. about. Uh, and maybe you can just preface it quickly. Yeah. So, <laughs> Canadian art pronounced Archer Patchewis dead. <laughs> they, I wrote an article for them, and I was granted a lot of stories. I cashed in a lot of um, community connections to like, get those histories. And I foolishly just passed off my text to Okay, let me pull back. I gotta like think about how I'm gonna talk about this in public. Um, it, so those institutions really arise from their own scarcity driven, all the, like, first I should preface this by saying the kind of support that I do have within that institution. So David Balzer, who is the editor of Canadian Art, just came in and was like, we're tearing this thing apart and we're gonna rearrange this and we're gonna like make this like right because there was a lot of issues previous to um, him being there. And the first thing that he wanted to do was bring in an indigenous editor because uh, previously Canadian art had just not been covering uh, indigenous art 
well. <laughs> that's like the legacy that we were given, and that's just the truth. It hadn't been covering indigenous art well. And so he hired an advisory committee, um, and I was like the least senior person who applied for this position, and David Balter just saw my vision, and he really just gave me a shot. So like I recognized the incredible support that I have from those people. Um, at the same time, they're settlers, and so they're not gonna understand every aspect of like, they don't get that this, this work isn't separate of us, that our art isn't like this thing that we cast off from ourselves. It's like our love and life and our like community and like there's so much history and like knowledge that goes into like these moments that is so delicate to like work through. Um, and they wrote a header, they didn't even like, a header was written that wasn't fact checked that said that Archer Pachowis had actually died. Pachowis, which is horrifying because he's actually been going through a terrible year with his own family and some pretty traumatic stuff. So it was chaos, basically. Um, and I think what I learned from that is I can't trust anyone. Like, I, I have to keep my hands on my work every step of the way. Like, I have to see every part until production, like, what is happening with my work. And even if I have good rapport with settlers, it doesn't make them less complicated or problematic when dealing with these works. So it's just gonna be more work, I guess, <laughs> yeah. Hi. Hi. <clears throat> I was intrigued uh, with your, uh, when you um, said, I think I have it right, um, that the fine art world doesn't know how to characterize indigenous art. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think you've uh, just spoken uh, somewhat about the, um, uh, sort of what uh, indigenous art is, uh, uh, la you know, um, that the art world lacks. But I, I wonder if you could uh, sort of envision for us what, uh, the um, dominant art world would be if it fully uh, incorporated in indigeneity, indigenous art into its um, structures? I mean, we're always residing on indigenous territories. Um, so I feel like there's no excuse for galleries to not have indigenous curators, indigenous staff, or, and not just like as token like indigenous people, working, indigenous curator in residence. Like, I wanna see an ED of the Vancouver Art Gallery that's indigenous, like, we just need, um, and I know that sounds a lot like respectability politics or like we need more integration, um, but it doesn't just stop at that, it's like, you, I feel like there's this lens that curators will often project on indigenous art and they need to understand it through the ways that they've learned art. So Leanne Simpson talked a lot in that interview about her work and how it's always so misunderstood and people are like, well, is it spoken word? Is it a uh, performance because she has the videos? Is it writing because it's also a book? And she's like, it just is. Like, that's just what I created and I don't need to label it within these like categorizations because this is who I am and this is what I created. So just giving space for these articulations to come out naturally and not trying to force them into the white box is so important. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I'm pretty, I don't know, I like, Grew up anarchist punks. I'm like, let's just tear down the gallery. <laughs> <laughs> but obviously, that's not, you know. I like that. Good for that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lindsay, for your uh, presentation. <clears throat> this is a, it's it, uh, probably just more maybe look at perhaps what is your experience been so far, but maybe a comment as well mm -hmm. when it comes to indigenous uh, art criticism. Uh, I think it's an, an in interesting space because uh, uh, I think in the last 10 years in particular, we've had a proliferation of uh, emerging artists mm -hmm. uh, and of course established artists in mid-career and we're all in sort of our different sort of spaces in, in, in creation, creating art. But it was one of the things I found very early on that it was very hard to criticize each other's art uh, from an indigenous perspective. Uh, quite simply, because we, we, come, we, come, we come from that history of trauma. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, all our lives we've been criticized about something, mm -hmm. about our indigeneity, so when it comes to art, you know, we tend to take it personally. So I think it, it's one of those things that I always wondered about because, you know, we're often more champions of each other's work than we are actually mm -hmm. criticizing it. And, uh, 
And it's interesting because as more work is produced, you know, and like all art, some art's great, and some art's not that great. <laughs> so, you know, I, I guess the, the, the question I would be is that I think within the indigenous community, I think sometimes we tend to take things more personally, and mm. it's hard, and how do, we, how do we sort of get to that point where we don't hate each other, <laughs> you know, and, and all that sort of stuff? Because I think that is actually a really interesting part of it, this idea of indigenous criticism, what, you know, because we're told by our elders to be kind and to be, you know, generous and all that sort of stuff. But I'll also tell you, too, that, you know, you have to say things when they need to be said as well. Mm. So I think that, that it is an interesting space, and I'm still wrapping my own mind around it, and like, how do we criticize be, uh, 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 each other without it becoming something more than what actually it is, because it should be the furtherance of knowledge, of course, and, and, and discussing problematics of, of works, because I think there are a lot of problematics starting to arise. Mm -hmm. And so I think, not that they weren't there before, but you know <laughs> what I mean, it's, I think it's becoming more predominant. So I guess my question is like, how are you finding it being in that sort of position? Mm -hmm. And do you have any thoughts around that? Well, yeah, I think that's why it's so hard for me <clears throat> to move into the space of art criticism because I am such a kinship based person. So it's not natural for me to like talk shit about people or like talk smack on people's work or whatever. And I always want to do that from like a space of like care. And if I like, I learned that if I'm talking in that way to someone, I should have a relationship with them. I can't just like, you know, like I don't know them. So it's really complex. And I think that, I think a lot about Julie Nagam because she, um, she did a lot of calling in of me and like holding me close during some hard times this last year. And she talked to me a lot about her experiences just like in the last two decades. And um, she called, she talked about this thing called critiquing the critique, which was increasingly emerging um, indigenous art criticism where there is this like idea where it's like, oh, indigenous people are so, um, wary of critiquing each other, so like we're gonna like bring it up to like max level and just like come running out of the gate to like the most intense critique we can possibly make or whatever, which is usually like very uh, masculinist and it can be like projected on like uh, indigenous projects that are like indigenous feminist or community based and calling um, like calling walking with our sisters neo shamanism <laughs> for instance, like these kind of things can emerge, but um, I I think about that a lot and I think that. I just want to, that's why I want to move away from the space of calling the work that I do criticism and I want to do community based, call it community based arts writing because I do work with artists who I have personal relationships with and who I feel comfortable writing about their work in those ways and I don't, I don't think, I don't feel comfortable in those realms of just like absentmindedly throwing like baseless critiques into the world to tear down other indigenous people's work precisely because we do come from a space of trauma and we are so, we can be combative that way because we're like embodying so much trauma and um, thanks, Lindsay. Um, I just have a, I guess I have a couple of points. One would be that, um, uh, because I write as well, and I always I find it very interesting how the idea of criticism is um, discussed mm -hmm. and and sometimes not maybe broken down enough. So whether it's a you know evaluative criti criticism that may actually make differences or uh, negotiate good and bad, or whether we're looking more at an interpretive criticism. Or I really like your idea of this kind of community-based uh, 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 conversation, if you will. Um, but it, those are sort of asides. But I guess one of my questions is. Uh, where do you see or do you see a potential for collaboration between um, indigenous and non-indigenous uh, writers uh, within the field of uh, art criticism? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of folks who actually do that really well, like Heather Igloliorte and Carla Taunting come to mind about folks who work in collaboration in that way. Um, and I think Carla's really good about checking her privilege and then always like, um, talking from a decolonial perspective or a settler colonial perspective. Um, at the same time, though, I think those things emerge from relationships. I don't know, like, I don't know if I would necessarily write, because I write so intimately about, like, my identity, um, and so that's kind of ceremonial for me, the things I'm talking about. And so if I'm doing that writing, I, I want it to be with someone who can share with that with me and see those parts of me. Great, well thank you so much, Lindsay. I know we have other questions and I'm wondering if we can uh, regroup at the break with those questions just so that we can uh, move along. But please join me in, in thanking Lindsay for her presentation. <laughs> All right.
Is that on? Yeah, okay, great. Uh, thank you, Suzanne, and the Burra College of Art and Design for organizing and hosting this symposium, and for having me here today to share my story. I'll just get this set up. Uh, while I was putting together this presentation, I found it uh, really helpful to do a little doodling. So I'm going to recreate some of that doodling. I don't know if anyone in the back will be able to see, but I'll just do it anyway. You can always come down and check it out later. Um, so I'll just start. So I'm just, I took a bit of this very literally, and I'm literally locating myself on a map. It's not the scale. Thank you all for attending. Um, this is actually a bit of a homecoming for me. ACAD, which was still called ACA when I attended, is my alma mater. It's a real honor for me to be back in this lecture hall addressing you from the podium where I heard so many wonderful artists share the practice with me. Is there a little bit of feedback, or is that just me? A little bit. Um, I've been asked to discuss the ways in which I locate my practice as a visual artist with a narrative of history, place, and belonging. Um, I would say that I situate myself as an indigenous artist, dialoguing Dene and indigenous resistance to colonialism in relation to state narratives of resource extraction economics. Sounds a bit much, but uh, before I delve into that, I should provide more information on my background. Um, I am Dene from Dega Kotie Quenet, which is also known as Jati Kwe, and by its English name of Fort Providence. We just call it Prov. Uh, Denende, or the land of the people, is what we refer to the Northwest Territories. Another name for our country is Nande, our land. I was born and raised in Denende in the communities of Fort Providence and Hay River, or Haver. They really like to shorten things down. Um, the son of Rita and Al Coates. My mother's parents were Madeline and Bruno Canadian of Fort Providence and Horn River and my father's parents were Agnes and Wilford Coates of Dorset and Renfrew Shire, United Kingdom. My father emigrated from Scotland to Canada in 1969 to work for the Hudson's Bay Company in the north, so that also makes me and my siblings a part of the Scottish diaspora. And I've got to remember to change slides, too. Um, a funny story about growing up um, mixed race. Uh, my mother lost her uh, status when she married my father. Um, so we kind of, we grew up in the Dene community. We knew we were Dene. But at one point, um, when I was a teenager, and my siblings are younger than me, uh, the Métis Nation came by, and they knew that we had no status. So they, they tried to sign us up. And, uh, and my mom let them. <laughs> I was like, what are you doing? I'm Dene. But anyway, um, we moved on through that. And I actually never heard from the Dene Nation after that, or the Métis Nation after that. Um, so my Dene grandparents lived in the bush for a good part of their life, hunting and trapping, as long as their situation allowed them to. Um, my mother and most of her siblings were born out on the land. You never say, though, that they were born in the bush. My mom took really good offense to that. Uh, I guess that was just the legacy of the colonized North. Unfortunately, Living free on the land for Dene was curtailed. There were several reasons for this, increasing pressures from newcomers and their government being in the main. 
Despite this, traditional activities such as spring and fall hunts, fishing and trapping are still a regular part of life. Fort Providence was long site for Roman Catholic missionaries. Um, children from all around Catholic Decho were sent to the Sacred Heart Mission at Fort Providence, which was established in 1858. My mother was raised and taught at that mission, as were a few of her siblings. The legacy of that mission is still felt today, especially in regards to the decline of Dene, -E, our language. My mother's first language was actually French, and then it was Dene, -E, and then it was English. Growing up in Den and Den in the 70s and 80s, I was perfectly aware of the northern political landscape that had come into being after the opposition to the Mackenzie Valley Pipeline, the formation of the Dene Nation, and the Berger Inquiry. The controversial pipeline proposal brought forth by Calgary oil companies spurred on Dene political activism, leading to increasing influence in a region that had an indigenous majority. I grew up within the Canadian Northern colonial narrative, but I also grew up in a time of growing indigenous resistance to that narrative and to a colonialism that took the form, not least in part, of unilateral and invasive resource extraction backed by provincial and federal governments. Oil and gas has a long history in the north. As early as 1888, a geographer referred to the Mackenzie Basin as petroliferous and recommended that the Canadian government enter into treaty with the Dene in order to secure the oil and gas reserves. But it was not until oil was officially discovered at Norman Wells in 1920 that the government pursued a treaty with the Dene. A year later, one year later, Treaty 11 was signed. And by no means was oil and gas the only resource Canadians were after, as attested to by the mineral mines at Nahani, Pine Point, uh, Ray Rock, Thor Lake, Yellowknife, Port Radium, and so on. More familiar to Canadians is Alberta's long-standing narrative of oil and gas exploration. The first oil boom in the province was set off by the discovery of oil southwest of Calgary at Turner Valley in 1914. That's Turner Valley. That's, my, that's a version of an oil derrick. I never said I was a good illustrator. Um, later in the same century, my parents moved to Turner Valley in 1998 and my wife and I followed that same year. My wife and I have lived there ever since, and it's a lot prettier and much easier to breathe there than it was during the days of oil derricks and gas flares. I'm actually a little behind on my slides, but uh, that's the Roman Catholic mission in uh, Prov. That's a photo of my mother at the mission. She's on the far right bottom. Um, this is a photo of uh, our leaders voting on the formation of the Dene Nation. There we go. That's Turner Valley back in the day. Although the oil fields have long been played out, you can still visit the historical Turner Valley gas plant to get a sense of this timeline. It was only three years ago the province celebrated the 100th anniversary of that first discovery. Now, as everyone knows, the action is in the Fort McMurray, Fort Mackay area we know as the oil sands. There's another, there's another crappy derrick. I don't need to go into the issues surrounding the oil sands and concerns that both native and non-native communities have about its effects on the environment right now. Suffice it to say that for Suffice to say that the oil sands are located in Dene Suthlene territory and within the Alba Athabasca Peace Decho watershed. <laughs> Taking history and geography into account, so I'd say it was only natural that I locate my practice within the petro narrative. I wonder if I even had a choice in the matter. On the other hand, is it natural that I situate myself in opposition? There are indigenous, indigenous narratives in Alberta that embrace oil and gas development, uh, if only for economic reasons. 
One of these reasons, for example, is that Syncrude claims to be the largest employer of Indigenous people in Canada. I would say that I was raised to have a concern for the well-being of my family and the land, so yes, where the industry threatens Dene well-being, I'm in opposition to it. However, I would hope that where issues are not black or white, that my work reflects that. In regards to the question of belonging, there's no question that I belong to the north, despite my physical absence. I would also claim to belong to the mountains and foothills of southern Alberta, which I love almost as much as the Detcho. I've not discussed belonging to a national narrative. Um, whether or not I process my relationship with Canada as one where I can identify as Canadian is a question that becomes increasingly difficult to answer as I don't see a sincere effort at the national level to include my people and our shared history within any narratives. In 1993, I had the opportunity to attend public consultations held by the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples in Hay River. The commission was struck as a response to national events involving Federalist forces and Indigenous nations, such as the Oka Crisis and the Meech Lake Accord. In 1996, the commission published its findings, presenting a final report of 4,000 pages. The original report set out a 20-year agenda for implementing changes. Suffice it to say, based on the commission's suggested points and the actual outcomes, the report makes a great paperweight. Um, sorry, I'm trying out here. Uh, perhaps its objectives were too complex, perhaps they were too lofty to put into action, but my sense is that there was and continues to be a lack of interest on the federal government's part as a whole to truly engage with the Indigenous population. During Stephen Harper's tenure, it was easy to frame the ongoing for a failure to commit to equalizing the structural inequities between our nations as being a conservative ethos issue. However, it's become clear that self-determination for Indigenous peoples continues to be viewed as threatening, nowhere more so than in the North, where a land claim known as the Decho process has stalled time and again since the 70s. Reconciliation, as touted by the federal government, is increasingly seen as a hollow process where our part as reconciliators, I don't know if that's a word, but I'm going to use it anyway, has been mandated, where we are expected to overlook ongoing issues of inequality in access to education, health care, and even potable water, whereas government and industry's role continues to be that of exploiters, trying to push pipelines and dams through our lands without our consent. I do, however, allow Canadian citizens and institutions for taking on the TRC's recommendations I do find that extremely heartening. These are the narratives that I find locate me and my practice. Thank you for listening. So, I didn't talk much about my artwork, but um, so I'll just flip through these briefly and that then. Was be my first question. Yeah, <laughs> I forgot about that part. Um, I'll just flip through these real quick and maybe if you want to throw questions out there, it's fine. I was just going to ask if you wouldn't mind maybe just a couple slides around your the work and talking about your um, some of the process of working through what you just uh, presented and then it, the honing of the different materials and the, your art. <laughs> Thanks. Sure. Thank you so much, by the way. It was a really, really, thank you. Thanks. Um, yeah. Well, this piece uh, was in the Alberta Biennial in 2013. Um, I didn't hear a lot of feedback from that show, but uh, there was two positive-ish things said um, in articles, in reviews. One person said that they were really nice updated native wall hangings. Thanks. <laughs> Another person said that they were the best thing in the show. It's too bad the native peoples are vanishing. Uh, <laughs> yeah, these were contemporary reviews. Um, but overall, the show was well, well received. Um, <laughs> so this, this piece was an exploration of, uh, I use exploration way too much. Um, it was dealing with um, the problem of um, pipelines through our territories and the concerns and dreams that the First Nations have um, 
processing um, the possibilities, economic and um, environmental. Um, so the black is cloth, and then there's satin ribbon coming off the paintings, and then the, the canvas itself is acrylic. So what I try to do in my work is, is celebrate our resistance as opposed to um, just presenting um, tragedy. I, I don't, I'm not interested in relaying anything like that. So I, I try to celebrate our resistance, our, our, um, our resilience. This one's called Hustle and Blow, Flow, or you can read Keepers of the Athabasca. And this one also deals with, uh, there's actually a group called Keepers of the Athabasca in northern Alberta, and, and they are on the ground uh, fighting to keep our waters clean. So this, this was honoring them. And what I try to do with ribbon work is sort of personify the piece the artwork and, and sort of make them echo bodies, <laughs> sort of like dancers, but I don't want to take that too literally. Um, and the reason I use ribbon as a celebratory, celebratory aspect is, is sort of inspired by, um, well, it used to be inspired by powwow dancing. I've taken that further, I, I hope, and I'm really trying to explore the use of materials. Sorry, I'm hiding behind that. I'm really trying to explore the use of materials um, and textiles and work, um, thinking about how um, family use textiles and, and, and all kinds of um, stuff in like clothing, like um, one of the previous panelists mentioned, Jesse. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Anything else? I actually stole that phrase. I didn't make it. <laughs> I saw it on a placard. Hi, Bruno. Hi, Jesse. Um, I'm curious about your name. Is that your given name? Bruno? Canadien. <laughs> Bruno. <laughs> yeah. Or is that a chosen name? No, Canadian is my um, grandparents' name. I might have spoken too fast over that section. But oh, okay. Yeah, it's my family I name. I missed that. On my Dene side. Oh, um, okay. It's French, too. Yeah. Canadian. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yep. Thanks. I'm getting an interesting read also from your work because uh, I get I think I was feeling like the, the like the ribbons and that, but there's also like tags, like you know when you're tagging off the land, um, yeah. I often see that you know, and I think it's it's a really um, kind of uh, it's an inter like it's a, it's a seductive way about speaking about something that's like really detrimental to or like like something like this you know, um, that's kind of a, an interesting way of talking about something that's super detrimental to our our land, essentially, um, and to like be mixing those materials. I don't know if that was conscious, but like that's what I re I just like I can't help but see like the orange tags or like different bright colored tags when you're like par partitioning off land or uh, for different types of either you know for development or like whatever you know. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, but yeah, and almost like this bullseye kind of effect too that's kind of happening like the cir like end circles. So yeah. I think there's like this interesting duality that is kind of at play because I f I f like, I'm like, wow, it's so beautiful, but it makes me a little bit uncomfortable too. Yeah. Great. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I'll just go back to another one like that. I sort, of, I sort of have a rule that whenever I see a survey tape in the woods, I take it home. It's material. <laughs> Pardon? Sure, yeah. I need blue. Blue is hard to come by. Um, <clears throat> uh, thanks, Bruno, for your presentation. Lovely work and uh, I admire your uh, activism. Uh, as we speak, downtown Calgary, Indigenous leaders are meeting with uh, uh, oil executives uh, to discuss 
the future of indigenous participation in <laughs> oil and gas as the industry, of course, is in decline and such, we're finally kind of being welcomed in. <laughs> so there's a bit of an ir irony there. Um, but it is, a, it, it is an interesting thing, and I, you know, I personally look at it, I, these ideas of divide and conquer, but at the same t time, a lot of indigenous people, uh, in particular, a lot of our leaders are sort of jumping on the, you know, the oil and gas, or into the oil and gas industry. Um, how do we, you know, I guess, how do we resolve that, or how do we come to terms with that? And I, I, I you know, I, I find it difficult sometimes, you know, because a lot of our organizations receive money from oil and gas uh, situations. If, if we never got that, probably nothing would re really ever happen. But at the same time, it's conflicted, you know, and, and stuff. So I, I certainly find find myself in that position. But I guess I guess what I'm saying. What are your thoughts on that? And, and how, you know, is there a resolution? How do we you know, as artists, you know, interpret that and proceed. Right. Yeah, it's super complicated. Um, I'm not in complete opposition to oil and gas development. It's just where it is destructive. You know, um, and in some places, it's obviously destructive and should stop. But uh, I think in other places, like since the 70s and the attempted push through of the Mackenzie Valley Pipeline through Denende, um, oil companies have worked with Dene groups to develop uh, Claire Goli, which was Norman Wells, um, and sort of do a scaled down version of the pipeline, which um, you know brought some economic activity to the First Nations up there. Um, yeah, it's complicated, you know. <coughs> I think uh, I think this whole worry about uh, uh, the decline in oil and gas is a little overblown because oil and gas is pretty much all we, it's everywhere in Alberta, right? It's everywhere. I, I'm not really worried about it declining too much until um, electric cars take over or something. So I, I don't know. You know, I'm, I don't, well, and who am I to, to condemn anybody for anything, really, because I sort of have a, well, anyway, I'm just me. But if the leaders want to meet and develop oil and gas, you know, and they think that's the best way forward for their people, then, you know, they're, they're our leaders, right? Hopefully they're doing what's best. I, you know, uh, uh, among the many things I do, one of them is i involved in the energy industry uh, in a council for the provincial government. And uh, we, you should all listen to a gentleman on the YouTube, and his name is Tony Siba. And he speaks about the financial aspects of the fossil fuel industry and more to the uh, alternate energy uh, process. And uh, uh, he, he says that by the year 2022, 20, uh, we will be uh, getting uh, power from sources that are way cheaper than just transmitting oil. So pipelines will be really pointless at that point because it costs more to transmit the oil than it does to generate the power in solar panels and things on your roof. And so uh, it's, uh, he also says that by the year 2025, all cars will be electric, all vehicles will be electric. And uh, so really the, 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 the fight with the oil industry, we will always be using oil, by the way, for the petrochemical industry, but the energy use in cars and large vehicles and buildings will mostly come from the sun by that point. Just an interesting sideline. Thank you. Did you want to respond, Bruno? Or Pardon? Did you want to respond? I, we're running a little bit short on time, so I do need to uh, move along. But sure. I want to leave you with the last word. <laughs> no, it's fine. I'm okay. good. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Test, test. Good, yeah. All right. Can I ask Compton? Exucapi? Close. Sixica, Piconi, Kainai, Tsutina, Egua, Nakoda, Mina, Apito, Kusso, San, Inoako, Tse. Cheryl around down and say, Gasson, Api, Togo, San Square, Nioma. Nehi or square will miss the go so you know square. Um, I'm a squatchy or sky gun, I got papa's chase or chinia, maga Toronto, me got new again. So there's some words from the language a little bit north of here, um, the place now known as Edmonton. Um, and I have to say, it's taken me a long time to learn how to do things the right way. I'm quite backwards. So um, today was one of the first times I've ever uh, done a land acknowledgement at the beginning and, uh, and I, think, I think we should just do it all the time until, we, until it becomes like, you know, the first thing you do when you wake up in the morning, just be grateful. So I'm extremely grateful and get an ask on the wow Suzanne for inviting me. Um, I actually was... Um, Couple disclaimers I uh, have to let you know about. Oops, this is supposed to, you guys have to help me. When this ends, you have to say slide, and then I'll just start it again. I'm just gonna show some work. I'm not gonna um, talk about it specifically, but just as a visual backdrop, we are in a visual uh, institution. So a couple disclaimers. Um, one is related to this institution. I was actually thrown out of uh, ACAD in 1981 <laughs> after one year. Um, so, um, I, I, I'd, do, I'd say what my mother always say, like, you know, well, I'd actually say, don't do what my mother says, you know, do as I say, not as I do, or you know, I think, anyways, you get the idea. The other disclaimer is that um, I come from a family who knows how to make a short story really long. <laughs> so, I'm really glad that there's people who are going to give me uh, warnings. So, um, the other thing, I, warning, uh, is that um, I just want to suggest, I'm recording this, good. I just want to suggest that don't walk away from what I said thinking you know what I said. I've, I've learned from my mother that, you know, we all speak in very encoded ways. Uh, and so I'm glad they're doing uh, recordings of this. Not that my talk is uh, Im any more important than anyone else who has spoken, but but usually we have to like recontextualize, recontextualize, recontextualize until we have a real deeper understanding, uh, something that resonates really deep with us about what we, what we thought we heard. Hey? And that's why stories are told over and over and over and over and over and over. So um, I am um, currently doing a mid-PhD um, in Dublin. I'm investigating the nexus of indigenous language resurgence, site-specific land-based environmentalism, so really interested in Bruno's work, um, and a song creation using pervasive, immersive, and other digital technologies as an interface to el elucidate my findings. But like I said, I won't speak about that work today. I really loved the charge that we were given in uh, what today's uh, and tomorrow's gathering is about, and I thought about that. So the last couple of days I've been jotting down ideas and things. Um, so s questions I'm asking myself, especially being here since the fact that our, our family uh, has camped at the foot of um, Nose Hill for, I don't know, since the 60s, I guess. What are the implications of the natural or native sonics of place? And what happens when we superimpose or layer other sounds on top? Or maybe even more specifically, what happens when we stop listening and speaking with and resonating with land? So I'll sing a little bit of a song to just bring myself here. Namoya ota e piwana toya tipi a kipiwi tap sum tan ipinga mota yano taski hey 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 So those words that I just sang mean I'm not here to disrupt anything. 
I'm only here to sing this beautiful land. And I sang that song a couple weeks ago. It was, and I should state that I, I co-wrote that song with two very dear colleagues, uh, Mo Clark, who's a Métis from Calgary originally, and uh, Joseph Netauha, who's uh, my brother and my longtime collaborator. And we wrote that song in, in uh, the place called Toronto. And we wrote, those, uh, we wrote a series of songs as indigenous allies to the place, recognizing that we're not from there, but we were there and we wanted to be as consonant as we could. You know, that notion of harmony when it's a nice harmony, you know. We wanted to be as, as consonant and supportive of that place as we possibly could. So recently, um, I sang that song um, uh, a couple weeks ago here at the Legion uh, for the uh, symposium uh, that was along with Extra Textual, the exhibition that's on at the Calgary Contemporary Gallery. And uh, I have to say, um, I was severely uh, sleep deprived and also um, really, really felt impacted by the amount of uh, old, old man and old lady spirits that inhabits that place, you know? And so it was a bit kind of uh, dissonant, actually, having a young contemporary audience there. And, well, my mom used to, my mom used to party there, so, you know. I, <laughs> and I used to go visit her every now and again when I was a punk. A punk. Um, so <laughs> I do remember a lot of people there. Um, keep why? Slide. Slide, thank you. You're my pal. Um, so nevertheless, um, I sang that song and being in this sort of altered state, um, it was um, told to me later by somebody who doesn't want to be identified that I um, posited that, uh, that the Blackfoot and the Cree were enemies and I said that in a room of, of mixed non-Indigenous and Indigenous people. And, you know, I took that to heart and I, and I in thinking about the charge of this, um, Oh, thanks. I didn't quite get it, did I? Uh, thinking about the charge of this um, today's symposium and tomorrow's symposium, I thought, oh, well, you know, that's, that's unfortunate. So I will take that to heart because to be Nehiwak, to be Cree, means uh, Nehi is thought to be a, a root word that means to be exemplary. So there's, no sh there's this notion that to be a Cree speaker is to be an exemplary speaker. And I think the same would be, uh, Adrian, for your language, for all of our indigenous languages, they're so rich. And, and Leroy Little Bear talks about this, about how you know, your language is like um, um, a periodic table. And you take all these little roots and you combine them together to create meaning and to create things. So I took this to heart and I thought, okay, well, um, I didn't record myself that night and it was just because I was so sleep deprived it just doesn't want to go, does it? All right, start again. Um, I'll let you fiddle and, and um, I thought, well, I didn't record myself, but okay. My natural thing is to go um, in my own indigenous way of doing research is to, uh, you can just leave it there. It's a fine slide. It's, it's a lovely slide, don't you agree? It's lovely, just leave it there. It's leave well enough alone as my mother would say. Um, so I do what I've done for many years and since starting the PhD, my research has expanded a bit more. So my first thing would be to you know, go to my family. In this case, uh, these days I'm going to my ceremonial lodge family. Um, then I would extend it outwards, I would go to some other elders. Then I would extend it outwards, I would go to some linguists, some indigenous linguists. Then I would extend it outwards and I would go to some indigenous writers who I really respect. And then I'll extend it outwards to sort of weigh it a little bit with, uh, you know, with other thought from other cultures and just kind of see, you know, where, is, where, is, where are these ideas lying? So, so I, did, I did that and this is what um, um, Cree researcher and thinker uh, Willie Ermine says is um, something that Eber Hampton, who the Chickasaw academic Eber Hampton, challenged him to do. He said, when, when in doubt and when you're thinking that something that you're researching or studying or working on or, or being challenged with, uh, and you're thinking it's just coming too much from a Western or a dominant culture or cl colonized sort of framework, feed it to your language, you know? Feed it to your language and see what, what your language says. So I did that and I have to say, um, 
that was only, what, two weeks ago, so I haven't gone as far as I've explained I usually go. But here's what I can tell you to this point. Um, let's look first at the English definition of enemy. It means, by some dictionary definitions, a person who is actively opposed or hostile to someone or something. Okay, that's interesting. I mean, that sort of paints a bit of a picture of historically um, adjectives uh, that have been used against us, you know, and, and who we are and how we, how we live in this land. Um, so then I thought the next thing is to go to the language, feed it to the language. And in, and in Cree, the term for enemy, if you translate it, it's gustagan. And what does that mean? It means that you're afraid of something. Oh, well, that's interesting, okay. It's not hostile, it's not, you know, it's, there's a fear. And what does fear usually do? It kind of raises your adrenaline, you know? So, um, so here's where I'm gonna elaborate a little bit and play you a little audio because I did warn you with a disclaimer that I tend to make short stories long. Um, I'm just gonna minimize this for a second and I'm gonna play you the song and then I'll describe to you what what it is that you just heard. <coughs> There we go. So back to the slideshow, which I think might fare better again. Um, so that song was um, sung by, again, my longtime collaborator and brother, Joseph Nitauhau. And um, so he's, he's one of the first people I went and, and talked with this notion about enemy or traditional enemy or territorial enemy. And um, it's a song that is from Kayas Manakayas. It's an old song. And it's also a southern song. And it's also a song that he heard, and this is part of intellectual property, to tell you the, where the song comes from. He learned it from Winston Watani who learned it from somebody in Meadow Lake. Now, Meadow Lake's kind of in northern Saskatchewan, but there's um, endings, verb endings on those songs, on those words in that song, which are actually southern Cree. Um, and so we know it comes from the south. It's not a northern song. And what the song uh, words say is that even though the white ponies are charging towards me, I will still sag away. I will still go, yeah! You know, I'll still shout out sort of with this sort of notion of, we're here, you know? And what the song is about is, uh, is um, Kayas Mana Kayas, a long time ago, um, it's said that at a certain point in the season when the young Cree men in camp were starting to get really restless and they, weren't, they didn't need to go out hunting because everyone was fed and there, you know, it wasn't ceremonial time and you know, it was like they were just getting restless. The old people used to say to them, why don't you go out and find some Blackfoot? And it wasn't meant as a, it was consent. They were given consent to go out, you know? And it might be a little raiding party that they went out on. It might be just, um, you know, just a way to kind of get, let off a bit of energy, right? And, uh, and it's said that, uh, and if any of you've heard the notion of counting coup, it was not about killing. It was not about, um, uh, you know, this hostile notion of, of the English definition of <laughs> enemy. It was this counting coup, like it was actually the stories that you could tell about how close you got to a Blackfoot, you know? Did you touch them, you know? Did you ride by on your horse and go you know? That was something to be proud of, you know? Like that's how close you got to, uh, to the Blackfoot. And probably, Adrian, we could tell some stories, probably went both ways. And, uh, and, and there would even be this notion that you would notch, you know, into, you know, whether it be your rifle or your knife or different things, you would make notches to sort of, those were how many times you actually got close enough, you know? So what does that do? That's adrenaline, that's, um, uh, you know, that's competition, that's a challenge, it's not combat, right? So, um, I'm just gonna find where I was quickly go off page, which is why I record myself. Um, 
so Joseph reminded me that it's, you know, it's really about having courage and it's about being present, you know, the sense of presence, you know. And I think that relates to this, to the challenge or to the charge that the elder gave us for this for symposium. You know, how do we be present in this space? Um, so now I'm going to refer back to Willie Ermine again, just quickly. He says in his essay, Aboriginal Epistemology, and if you haven't read it, I suggest you get it. It's a fabulous essay. He says, the year 1492 marked the first meeting of two desperate, disparate worldviews, each on its own uncharted course of exploration and discovery for purposeful knowledge. The encounter between two diametric trajectories into the realm of knowledge. One was bound for an uncharted destination in outer space, the physical, and the other was on a delicate path to inner space, the metaphysical. And he goes on then to say that, you know, um, the Western world has capitulated into a dogmatic fixation on power and control at the expense of authentic insights into the nature and origin of knowledge as truth. And that those people who seek knowledge on the physical plane objectively find their answers through exploration of the outer space solely on the corporeal level. Those who seek to understand the reality of existence and harmony with the environment by turning inward have a different incorporeal knowledge paradigm that might be turned Aboriginal epistemology. Aboriginal people have the responsibility and the birthright to take and develop an epistemology congruent with holism and the beneficial transformation of total human knowledge. The way to this affirmation is through our own Aboriginal sources. So, like I say, it's a very good essay. So it's, he says a lot. In fact, I think it's his PhD topic and he just needs to now go and do that. Although he's too much of an elder for me to tell that to, so. Um, but I would just say then, just to finish up, because I've, uh, I've got another minute or two, uh, back to my original questions, what are the implications of the natural or native sonics of place? And what happens when we superimpose or layer other sounds on top, or, or more specifically, when we stop listening, speaking with, and resonating with land? So the challenge that I would love to give you, the courage I would love you to have, is to ask somebody who knows the language of this place, ask for a word, and just learn it and say it always, say it every day in the same way the land acknowledgement is, should be said all the time. And go and listen and stop thinking in English just for a few minutes every day. I think we have one minute for questions. Two minutes for questions? Okay. Comments? Comments are good too. I don't know much, so. <laughs> hey, Mark. Hey. Um, so I've known Cheryl for uh, over a decade, which has been really great. Uh, to get to know your practice and some things you do, and I was listening to you talk. And I was thinking about how you, with your practice, you get out into all these different spaces, like one of the um, first images is the, the work on the side of the highway. You've also gotten into like stairwells, web space, um, radio, like airwaves and stuff like that. And so you, you're really, from my point of view, like you're always kind of like putting yourself out there or having that um, mm, I don't. I don't know voice or presence, and I was wondering if you could like talk a bit about how you relate to that. Like, is it a? I don't. I don't know. Is it like a personal thing? Is it a spiritual thing? Is it a community thing? How, is there a way that you could talk about that? I'd be. I'd be really grateful to hear. So, thanks, Mark. I think um, you know. I mean, I've been making work for over thirty years since I got uh, one more dig since I got kicked out of art college. Um, um, but one of the things I think probably in the last, um, I, I moved to northern Saskatchewan in early, um, mid, early, mid 1990s. And um, that was when I really actively started learning my language and getting to spend time with a lot of old people. 
And so that really, I think, was my first master's. And the late Aha Sumaskegan Esquio used to tell me that. That was my first master's. And I think what that taught me was um, there was a different way of seeing, seeing, understanding who I was uh, as I moved through time and space than, than any of the work previous. I mean, I can look back at some of the earlier work and go, oh, yeah, there was a hint. Oh, yeah, there was a hint there. Oh, there was a hint. Oh, yeah. But it was that real immersion that made me move forward or move out or just be in time space in a different way. And I think one of the big things that started to change was um, because I'd also around that time spent five years living in nine First Nations for five years almost solely, um, it made me realize that, um, you know, there was things about the art world that was quite exclusive and I wanted to try and create something that was more inclusive. I wanted not to be telling an in-joke that was abrasive and was going to uh, insult or uh, exclude people, but I wanted to try and embrace people more, and I wanted to try and create work that uh, different people could resonate with and uh, partake in or collaborate in or, you know, just on various levels. So I think that's probably why it I started to become thought of as a community-engaged artist, and I don't think it was really overt. It was just kind of like, well, you know, I, let's let's go see it, go into a community. And I also felt like in a lot of places where I went, um, I was really just going in as somebody who taught other people how to hold hands with each other. Like there was different parties that were always there, but sometimes you know you're never a prophet in your own land, as that saying goes. So to have somebody else come in just you know for a couple weeks and do some stuff you know, help people to kind of engage on different levels and then it was okay to kind of go, you know, there was some, there was some love here. I was always looking for the love. I never found it, so I just kept moving. So. How's <laughs> 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 that country song goes, eh? <laughs> we just have a couple more minutes for questions here, okay. so I'll just pass it on. And you, you have to, I do make long answers, so <laughs> okay. make it short. Um, you brought up your uh, collaboration with your brother and Mo Clark, and um, I've heard Mo's telling of that experience you guys had creating songs for the land, and I was wanting to know more about your perspective of that process. Well, it's part of my PhD work, so I, I was kind of trying to stay away from reading your chapter. Um, <laughs> um, I think. I mean, Mo and I have different perspectives about how that all started to happen. Um, I've known Mo for many years. I met her here in Calgary when she was a spoken word artist, mostly, and then met her a couple years later. Um, and I've moved. I was telling Lisa I'm transitioning, and whenever I say that, people go, "Really?" And I go, "Not that way. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just changing from being a somebody who's more uh, somebody who was more like looking for the next gig and the next show, and that you know. And I'm moving kind of the PhD is helping me to change that. And so um, meeting Mo was uh, meeting Mo again on the road was another way to sort of go. Hmm, she's the next generation. Like I don't have that energy. I don't have that energy to be touring and doing all that stuff. And she had a real desire um, to speak in her language. And actually, that's one thing. Um, and I and I don't want to shake my finger at anyone, but I mean, from where I came from. The old people would say, you're not that thing if you don't speak the language. And the reason wasn't in any way an insult to any of their family or grandchildren or to anyone here. It's the notion that, like in Cree, nehi awin, it means, uh, or nehi awin, the language of the Cree worldview. Weo is actually to sound the worldview. So it's kind of like echolocation. If you're speaking in your language, you're grounding yourself you know, in time space by speaking that language. So meeting Mo was a great way to say, let's write a, a new canon of songs, a new catalog of songs for you to go out in the world and, you know, slowly embody and, and be able to, you know, pass that on to whoever you meet. So, ekose. <laughs> great, thank well, thank you so much, Cheryl. Um, please join me in thanking Cheryl for her presentation.